tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Just south of Eidelberg sits Blackwater Swamp. Travel far enough in and you'll find the Harlow Estate. There's no local legends or ghost stories about it. And if you were to ask any of the locals about the estate, you'd come to the conclusion that no one cares. The Harlow Estate is, or rather was, a large two-story house that sits on a private island. Over the years, local kids started using the place to throw wild parties. That became sort of a tradition that lasted for years, till a particularly nasty hurricane season essentially destroyed the place. Slowly but surely, it was abandoned and left to rot away in the swamp. Even though most people ignored it, my friends and I still went there from time to time. There were three of us, Victor, Willie, and me, Carl. The swamp wasn't the safest place. Alligators, wild hogs, snakes, and spiders were the usual, but we were used to it. It was the summer of our senior year in high school, and we had all graduated and wanted to throw one last party at the estate before life pulls us away. Vic was in charge of beer and weed, Willie was bringing his hunting gear, and I was borrowing my cousin's airboat. The plan was to invite a bunch of people, but we kind of forgot we weren't what you'd consider popular. Of course, no one showed up. Which was fine with me, but now we were stuck with way too much beer and <laughs> nowhere near enough weed. <laughs> Cracking the cap of a fresh beer, Willie stood and raised his drink. Before he could spit out some corny toast, we started throwing rocks at him. Boo! Vic called out. If you say one more word, I promise you're swimming back, he added, nudging me and laughing at the look on Willie's face. <laughs> one thing led to another, and before we knew it, we were drunk. Right about here is where I had the genius idea of going inside the house to get some photos. The walk from our camp to the estate took a little longer than it should have, but considering how blitz we were, I'm surprised we made it at all. As the estate came into view, we were shocked at how bad it looked. Creeping vines had overtaken the front of the house, snaking their way up the walls and pouring in through the broken windows. The old wrought iron fence was a rusted heap nearly hidden by piles of debris from the flooding. Chugging the last of his beer, Willie tossed the can then aimed his flashlight at me. Hm, I say since this your idea, you go in first. Before I could say anything, Vic seconded the motion and shoved me towards the path leading in. Laughing it off, I shrugged and turned my attention to the house. The place was a mess. Most of the roof was missing, and what was there had collapsed. By the looks of it, we wouldn't be in there long. As soon as I stepped onto the path, I noticed the ground was soft. I didn't see anything out the ordinary till we were near the front steps. There were clusters of red-capped mushrooms growing on every inch of exposed concrete. We literally had to walk through them to reach the front door, and by the time I stepped inside, I looked like a powdered donut. Taking a moment to dust myself off, I looked around. Murky black water stood knee-deep throughout the first floor. I could hear something splashing around. I guessed it was a frog or something, cause it didn't sound big. Straight ahead of me, I could see the main stairway was still standing strong, but there was something wrong. On the second floor landing, there was a statue of a woman with what I thought was a child standing next to her. Focusing my light on it, I paused. The thing standing next to her was a creature. From the waist down, it was an alligator, and from the waist up, it was a human. 
but the face was a horrible combination of the two. Its oblong skull was lumpy and deformed, with features I couldn't clearly define as human or gator. Slightly stammering through my words, I called to the others. Hey, uh, do you guys remember a statue in here? There was a long moment of silence before Vic poked his head in and froze when he saw what my lie was on. Whoa, where'd that come from? He asked, stepping inside while motioning for Willie to follow him. Once we were all standing there, Willie laughed. Ah, hey, it gotta be fake. Who go through the trouble of putting something like that up? Our combined drunk logic said he was right, and to prove it, Vic sloshed through the water, then climbed up the stairs to see for himself. Damn, this thing is creepy, he called back to us before trying to shove the statue. When it didn't budge, he stepped back, scratching at his neck. Holy shit, it's a real statue. Wanting to get a look, Willie joined him, leaving me standing by the door. The layout of the place hadn't changed much. Other than the smell and the water, the hall to my left was partially blocked off by a collapsed ceiling. The large room to my right was overgrown by the vines coming in through the window and small clusters of those mushrooms. From what I could see, the hall leading to the kitchen was clear. The water would be deeper there, but it led to the back of the house. I was pretty sure the second floor was useless. There wasn't much there to start, so we weren't missing anything. We goofed around for a while, taking pictures and recording video for Willie's YouTube channel, then made our way to the kitchen. From there, we could take the back door to the garden so we could see if our weed plants survived. Technically, they weren't our plants. Over the years, lots of people planted seeds. It was another one of those traditions that started long before we ever saw this place. Aside from the garden, there were three smaller buildings behind the main house. No one ever used them because they were falling apart. The odds were there wasn't much left. By the time we made it to the kitchen, the water was waist deep. It didn't take long to realize a flaw in our plan. Standing water is a breeding ground for mosquitoes, and we were being eaten alive every step of the way. Making matters worse, there was so much debris piled against the back of the house we couldn't get the door open. After searching for a few minutes, I found a hole in the wall big enough for us to go through, but we had to crawl, and that meant being underwater for a few seconds. It was obvious this was a blank trip. There was no way anything survived, but we did it anyway. Well, I went through last. While I was waiting for Vic to clear the hole, there was a splash from somewhere behind me. Glancing back to the hall, a ripple rolled across the water coming towards me. I didn't see anything, but I knew there was something there. Quickly checking to see if the way was clear, I hurried through to catch up to the others. The second I stood up, Willie tapped me. Don't move, he muttered as I wiped the water from my face. When my vision cleared, my jaw dropped. There was a massive uprooted tree lying in front of us, but that wasn't the problem. What had to be a hundred swamp rats were perched on top of it, staring down at us. Moving slowly, Vic eased over and whispered, I think we should get back inside. As the words left his lips, the rats started jumping in the water. The next thing we knew, we were under attack. Go, go, go! I yelled, watching the beady-eyed horde swim towards us. In a mad scramble, we dove back through that hole and tore ass through that house. We ran all the way back to our campsite. Stinking of stagnant water and covered with mosquito bites, we stood there stumped, staring at nothing. Our boat was gone, and the camp was trashed. Jazz gonna kill me! How am I supposed to tell him his boat got stolen? I blurted out excitedly while pointing to where it had been. Walking up to the edge of the water, Willie replied, Fuck Jack! How are we getting home? The realization that we were stranded landed like a bomb. We had our phones, but there was no cell service in the swamp. The three of us stood there silently looking at what was left of our camp. Whoever had done this hadn't taken our supplies, but they were scattered on the ground. 
Willie's hunting gear was intact. There were three life vests and two overturned coolers. Aside from the boat problem, things could have been worse. Turning over one of the coolers and taking a seat on it, Vic shook his head. If this is a joke, it ain't funny, he said before picking up a beer, cleaning it off and opening it. I bet it was the gentries. They've been after us since last year. The gentries, Adam and Thomas, the year before we'd trapped them in a shipping container with a skunk. In our defense, it had been payback for them locking me in a porter toilet and pushing it over. Scooping up a beer for myself, I glanced over at Willie. He was picking up the life vest and mumbling something to himself. Shrugging it off, I wiped the can clean, opened it, and took a sip. <sighs> now, nah. if it was them, we'd know it by now. They'd have stuck around just to rub our noses in it. Besides, those two are dumber than dirt. I don't think they could come up with a prank this good. Vic nodded in agreement, then took a drink. We batted a few more ideas around, but Willie had been oddly silent. The entire time we'd been talking, he'd been staring out at the swamp with the life vest in his hands. Hey, what you doing? Vic asked, trying to get his attention. Without responding, Willie slipped the vest on, then started walking towards the water. Seeing what he was doing, we snapped into action. We managed to catch him just as his feet got wet. But the moment one of us touched him, he started yelling, Let me go! I can't stay here! He was frantic. It took the two of us to drag him away from the water, and he fought us the entire time. He wouldn't calm down. We literally had to pin him to the ground till he gave up. When he finally stopped fighting, he kept muttering, I can't stay here. I can't stay here. While rocking in his seat. I kept an eye on him while Vic got a fire started. Then we took turns watching him till we eventually fell asleep. Well, I couldn't tell you how long I was out, but the fire was still burning, so it couldn't have been long. I lay there staring up at the stars for a while. The crackling of the flames mixed with the sounds of the swamp was almost hypnotic. For a moment, I forgot just how screwed we were. Then I heard something in the distance. At first, it was faint, but as I focused, it became clear. A voice called out. Help! Please, somebody help me! I sat up looking around, but I didn't see anyone. Getting to my feet, I made sure Willie was still asleep. He and Vic were out cold, so I knew it wasn't one of them but the voice was still there. Help. Moving slowly, I went to the water's edge and looked further out. That's when I saw someone. There was a kid splashing around in the water. I couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl, but by the looks of it, whoever they were, they were in trouble. Help. Kicking off my boots, I rushed in and started swimming out to help. As I got closer, the splashing stopped and the voice went silent. There was no point in diving under to find them. The water was murky in broad daylight. At night, it would be like trying to see through mud. I swam out to the exact place I'd seen the kid, but there was nothing there. There wasn't much I could do, and being in the water after dark was dangerous, so I turned to start swimming back. I made it close to halfway when the voice cried out from behind me. Help! Good thing I was in the water, because I'm pretty sure I pissed myself when I turned and saw what was there. Maybe ten feet away from me, I saw someone staring at me. The top of the person's head was sticking out of the water, but it wasn't moving. Uh, are you okay? I called out. But there was no reply. The moment I made a move towards it, the head dipped below the water. When I'd seen enough, I turned away and started swimming back to shore as fast as I could. Well, I'm a decent swimmer, so I figured whoever it was wouldn't be able to catch me. But I was wrong. Something slammed into me. And a surge of pain shot up my left leg. Everything happened so fast I didn't have a chance to react. 
I was snatched under and immediately spun head over heels. My first thought was death row. A gator had me and I was about to be ripped apart. I felt my shin snap under the pressure as my body was ragdolled to the point I couldn't tell up from down. Fear flooded my body like the swamp water that was filling my lungs, and I blacked out. I guess the commotion woke the others because the next thing I knew, Vic was pulling me out of the water. What the fuck were you doing out there? He asked before seeing my mangled leg. Holy shit. Don't move. I'll be right back. Hopping to his feet, Vic hurried past Willie, who was sitting up, scratching the side of his face and muttering to himself. Still groggy, I puked up some water, then glanced down at my leg and started screaming. The skin of my shin had been stripped away, revealing broken bones and shredded muscle. I hadn't realized to that moment that I couldn't feel my leg. By the time Vic got back with the first aid kit from Willie's bag, I was in full panic mode. Once he finally got me still enough to bandage me up, I blacked out again. When I came to, Vic was sitting by the fire. He was bloody from setting my leg and he looked exhausted, but Willie was gone. Where'd he go? I asked as I sat halfway up supporting myself with my elbow. Closing his eyes and tilting his head back, Vic took a deep breath and tried to calm himself. While I was working on your leg, he took off. Before I could stop him, he put on that dumbass vest and got in the water. He wouldn't come back. I tried to get him to turn around, but he just kept going. What was I supposed to do? You were bleeding all over the place. I couldn't leave you there and go after him. Flopping back down, I tried to focus. My head was spinning and I felt sick. For the time being, I decided not to say anything about the kid I saw in the water. It would just add more problems and all I wanted to do was go home. The sun would be up soon. Even though no one came to the estate anymore, there were a few guys that fished in the area so there was a chance we'd get spotted if we stayed put. Since technically I didn't have a choice, staying where we were made sense. As the morning rolled in, I almost wanted to cry. Thick gray clouds hung high in the sky. Rain was coming. Great, I muttered to myself before glancing over at Vic. He hadn't moved since I woke up. Can't say I blame him this whole situation was out of control and by the look of it about to get worse. Thunder rumbled across the sky as the first few drops started to fall. Looking up laughing sarcastically, Vic threw up his hands. Oh, come on, man, seriously. What the fuck is wrong with you? Go away, he shouted at the clouds while fanning both hands to the side as if he were clearing them out. In most cases, this would seem strange, but that's Vic. Ever since we were kids, he talked to the clouds. He said it was something his granny taught him. There's good clouds and bad clouds. The good ones listen and the bad ones do what they want. He'd say it every time he saw rain coming. Shrugging his shoulders, he turned his attention to me. We can't be this close to the water. Looks like the bad clouds are here to stay. As much as I didn't want to risk moving, I knew he was right. The water rises fast in the swamp. It could go from bad to worse in a heartbeat. The only thing we had going for us was Willie's hunting gear. Aside from the first aid kit, he had brought his 22 long rifle with extra ammo in his pack. There were also a few cans of corned beef, spam, and chili along with some flares and a map of the area. I remember making fun of him for bringing all that stuff to a party, but I was glad he had done it now. Hoping the rain would pass true, we opted to take shelter a little further in, beneath the hanging moss trees. After an hour, it was clear the rain wasn't letting up. Vic yawned and leaned back against the tree. I don't think anyone's coming. Not right now, at least. Maybe we should move inside. It might not be perfect, but we'd be dry. 
He had a point. Besides, even if someone were to come by, they wouldn't have seen us under the trees. Going inside was probably the best choice. Once he had gathered the gear and helped me up, we made our way to the house. Somehow the rain made the place look creepier than it had before. Thinking about swarming mosquitoes and hordes of swamp rats almost made me change my mind. Look, we made it to the Mushroom Kingdom, Vic said jokingly as he helped me up the stairs. Every step we took released a cloud of spores. The rain kept it down, but it was still sticking to us as we crossed through the doorway. Once we were inside, he sat me next to the opening, then flopped down a few feet away. We were wet and cold. It was a miserable situation, but being inside was a hell of a lot better than sitting under a tree. After a short rest, Vic got up and started looking around. I'm going to go look for some dry wood. We might be able to get a small fire going, he said, getting to his feet and stretching. There was no point in arguing. It wasn't like I could stop him. I watched him search for a moment before I noticed something was different. The statue of the creature wasn't there anymore. I think there's someone else here, I said, pointing to where it had been. Vic paused and looked for himself, then scratched his head. Well, if someone else is here, they need to get their asses in gear and help us, he replied before yelling. You hear me? Get out here and give us a hand! He stood there silently for a moment before shouldering the rifle and pointing it to the stairs. I'm going to the second floor. There might be something we can use up there. Hang tight, I'll be right back. I watched as he sloshed through the murky water then made his way up to the next floor. Once he was out of sight, I sat there listening to the thunder trying not to think about the throbbing pain from my leg. I couldn't help but wonder about Willie. That was a long swim, and now that it was raining, the odds were he hadn't made it very far. As that thought crossed my mind, Vic came bounding down the stairs, carrying a metal wash tub he had filled with bits of dry scrap wood. Bingo, gringo! We've got action, he announced, holding up his haul so I could see it. I was surprised he had found anything, but having a fire to warm us up felt like the best idea ever. After poking a few holes in the wash tub, Vic piled the scraps in and lit the fire. We sat tossing in extra pieces till the flames were high enough to make a difference, then got comfortable and watched the rain. Eventually, Vic fell asleep. For the first few minutes, I couldn't take my eyes off the statue. There was something so familiar about her face. She reminded me of a picture I'd seen somewhere, but I couldn't place it. A loud splash from the hall caused me to look in that direction. We hadn't had a chance to see what was down there, but from what I could remember, it was the dining room. Out of the corner of my eye, I could have sworn the statue moved. It was a slight turn of her head, but when I looked, it hadn't budged. Wincing and laughing at myself, I rubbed my leg, trying to ease the pain. There were dark veins spreading up my thigh, and it was warm to the touch. I was pretty sure it was infected. Letting out a sigh, I leaned back, propping myself up against the wall. It was getting harder to stay calm, but panicking wasn't going to make things any better. Time passed slowly as I watched the water rising. We were going to need to move the higher ground if it kept up, and the only place I could think of was the landing where the statue was standing. A part of me was hanging on to the hope that Willie made it and was on the way back with help. The rest of me just hoped he wasn't dead. Closing my eyes and tilting my head back, I tried to relax. The squeaking of a rat changed that instantly. More out of surprise than fear, I turned and spotted it was swimming towards us. Wood rats are big bastards to begin with, but these were huge. From a distance, I'd swear it was a possum. The minute I laid eyes on it, more of them came swimming out of the hall sounding off. As the squeaks and squeals filled the air, I tried to wake Vic, but he wouldn't move. I had to get the rifle. Using my arms and one good leg, I dragged myself to where it was sitting. Praying for a good shot, I grabbed it, turned and fired without aiming. 
I missed. The lead rat climbed out of the water and rushed me as I checked another round, then fired. It was a hit, but it didn't matter. As the one fell, three more took its place, and behind that, another dozen with more on the way. All I could do was cover myself as the horde stampeded over us. Dozens of them clawing and scrambling for the door. They weren't attacking. They were running, and we were in the way. When it was over, and the last of them vanished into the rain, an eerie calm settled in. Vic was sound asleep. I thought he was dead till he stirred a little, then started snoring. Laughing and shaking my head, it dawned on me. The rats were running away from something. Shit, I muttered. There were eight shots left. Once I reloaded, I tried waking Vic again. Get up, man. We gotta go. There's... The sound of something big splashing around in the kitchen cut me off. I could hear it bumping against the walls of the hall for a moment, then it stopped. Loud sniffing followed by a low growl forced me to swallow the lump in my throat as I took aim. If it was a gator, the rifle wouldn't stop it unless I hit its soft spot at the base of its skull. That meant I'd have to be either standing or above it. I was fucked. I kept waiting for a massive gator to come charging in, but nothing happened. I wasn't about to stick around. I knew there was something in that hallway even though I couldn't see it. The door was a few feet away. I could possibly drag myself out, but there was no way I could leave Vic. Scooting to the door, I placed a rifle outside, then turned back and grabbed him by the arms. It was going to take a lot, but it had to be done. I strained and pulled using my right leg to help and managed to get us both halfway through the door. That's when it attacked. The first thing I saw was its head. An elongated mass of flesh, colored scales emerged from the water, snapping its jaws and reaching out with almost human-looking hands. I was still pulling at Vic's arms, trying desperately to drag him out, but it was too late. The creature grabbed him by the legs and snatched him away, causing me to fall back, landing in a bed of mushrooms. I was instantly engulfed by a cloud of spores. My eyes were burning and I couldn't breathe. Gasping for air, I sat up in time to see that thing bite into Vic's hip and tear off his leg before dragging the rest back in the water. Rubbing spores from my eyes, I reached for the rifle and froze when I heard rustling from the bushes to my right. There was just enough time for me to glance in that direction. A smaller version of what I had just seen launched itself at me. I felt it grip my shoulder and wrist, forcing my arm straight while simultaneously biting down on it. There was a loud crunch and my fingers went numb as the little bastard landed then immediately went into a death row. All I could do was gasp. It happened so fast my brain hadn't processed the pain. As the creature rolled for the first time the momentum slammed me face first into the ground knocking out my front teeth. The second roll snapped bone and tore tendons to shreds. The third took everything from the elbow down. The creature backed away eaten while I flopped around spraying blood and screaming at the top of my lungs. It finished my arm and was about to attack when a shot rang out. It snarled at me, then quickly turned and scrambled away, vanishing in the overgrown brush. Gunfire echoed around me as the pain kicked in and my body shut down. The last thing I saw was Sheriff Landry standing over me looking down. I was in a coma for three days and in the hospital for months. I lost my arm. They had to amputate my leg due to infection and my friends were dead. According to the doctors, the spores we inhaled caused us to hallucinate. We'd gotten dosed and stumbled into an alligator's nesting area. I told them about the creatures and the statues. 
They said the statue of the woman was an art exhibit from Crimson Creek, which is a town east of Blackwater Swamp. They showed me pictures. I instantly recognized it, but there was no creature with her. When I asked about it, I was told it had to have been a hallucination brought on by the spores. The more they explained everything, the more I started to believe their version of what happened. As it turns out, Willie was the reason they found me. His mangled torso was discovered by fishermen. The life vest had my cousin's info written in it, so they contacted him. Jack told them where we had gone. They found his airboat not far from where they had found Willie. All they recovered of Vic was his head and one of his legs. When it was all said and done, the whole thing was written up as a horrible accident. When I finally got out to hospital, I slipped into a deep depression. Both families blamed me for the deaths and I had to agree. It was my idea. They died because of me. Months passed before I finally looked through my phone. The photos and videos were still there. One photo in particular brought my world to a screeching halt. It was a picture I'd taken of Willie and Vic standing by the two statues. The thing that made my heart drop was the fact that the light from my camera's flash reflected in the creature's eyes. It wasn't a statue. It had been right in front of us, and we were too drunk to see it. In the video, I literally saw it turn to look at us. I posted everything online and told everyone that would listen, but no one believed me. They thought I was trying to make money off the death of my best friend. That led me to do some research on the creature itself. All I found were some pictures of Jack the Alligator Man. No one's been able to help me and most people think I've gone crazy. The only person that believes me is my cousin Jack, but everyone thinks he's crazy, so having him on my side doesn't help much. He wants me to go back there. That's not happening. There's no combination of words known to man that could convince me to set foot in black water again. Since I refused to go, Jack said he's going out there alone. His plan is to torch the estate and kill anything he finds. I've been trying to talk him out of it, but he won't listen. The only thing stopping him right now is his airboat. It was badly damaged when they found it. The repairs should be finished next week. That buys me a little time. If I can talk them out of it, this will be my last post. If I can't, this will still probably be my last post. It's been real. This is Carl Grant. Signing off. Once upon a time, there was a big bad wolf. Mom! Heather cried out loudly, cutting her twin sister off. She's doing it again! The girl's mother, Tracy, appeared at the door, flicking on the light and mock glaring at the two beds across the room. Heather was pointing emphatically at the other bed, where Linda had pulled the covers over herself. What's going on now? Tracy asked. Linda's scaring me! Heather pouted and continued to point at the giggling lump of blankets and sheets that was Linda. The ten-year-olds watched as their mother came fully into the room, pretending to scowl as she grabbed at the blanket-covered pile on Linda's bed. Clearly, she was not taking Heather's concerns seriously, a thought confirmed by Tracy reaching under the blankets and giving Linda numerous tickles. Heather huffed and crossed her arms over her chest defiantly as her twin squealed in delight. Her eyebrows were furrowed harshly as her mother turned to her with a smile. You know she's just teasing you, sweetie, Tracy said, moving over to Heather's side of the room. 
Some of the anger seeped out of the glowering twin as her mother sat next to her and tucked loose wisps of hair behind Heather's ears. She's been teasing me all of my life! The girl continued, trying to stay angry. It was hard when her mother's sweet voice and soft touch were so calming. Well, that's only been ten years, Heather. Tracy teased. And we got at least another ten more, quipped Linda from her bed. Heather glared at her sister, then huffed again and laid herself back down. Tracy tucked the blankets up around Heather's shoulders and chin, then kissed her forehead. She moved to the door, turning around once to wag a finger at both girls. I don't want to have to come in here again, okay? Let's have a quiet night tonight. Got it, ladies? Both girls nodded in unison, and Tracy turned off the light and closed the door. But once it was closed, Linda sat straight up in her bed and laughed, looking at Heather. <laughs> You're such a chicken. You make me a chicken. Heather insisted, sitting up as well. They're just stories. They can't hurt you. That's not the point. Linda laughed and fell back on her bed, smiling up at the ceiling. <laughs> you make it too easy, sis. Growling, Heather rolled over and put her back to her twin. She wanted to sleep. She needed to sleep. Linda was always making her life so difficult. Why couldn't she just let Heather sleep? For a few moments, there was quiet and blissful silence. But as soon as Heather noticed the serenity, it was shattered by a shrieking and howling sound. Heather sat up, panting and breathless, only to see Linda sitting like a dog in the middle of her little bed, head tilted back. Stop it! No! I heard something howling outside. The moon is full. I'm gonna howl too. Outside, beyond the house, the pack of sled dogs their father kept in a large barn began to howl. They made a terrible racket the various canine voices so out of tune with each other. Some were fluffy Canadian Eskimo dogs, while others were Chinook breeds. None of them bore the melodic sound of a wild wolf, and neither did Linda. It was a cacophony of noise that forced Heather to put her hands over her ears in an attempt to block it out. Shut up and go to bed! Heather insisted loudly, but Linda wasn't listening. Her sister continued to bay at the imaginary moon above her, lips puckered to extend her pretend dog-like muzzle. Mom! Heather screamed. Linda won't let me go to sleep! Now it was Tracy's turn to huff as she entered the room, this time leaving the light off. Heather watched her mother as she moved to Linda's bed, whispering to her firstborn. Linda seemed to calm and settle as Tracy tucked her in and kissed her. Then she went to Heather's bedside again, easing Heather into laying down. Listen, Tracy said, her voice almost a coo. Linda is your sister. She will always be your sister. But will she always be Linda? Heather snarled. Tracy put a finger to her lips silencing the girl's angry words and continuing to speak. The two of you are like the moon and the sun, just like them. One dark, one light. I'm the moon, right, Mom? Tracy shook her head, smiling and making Heather feel very confused. No, Heather. Linda is the moon, and you are the sun. But she's the bright one. Heather tried to insist. Tracy pulled the blankets up to her daughter's chin once more, tucking them firmly around her shoulders, as if that would keep her still for the rest of the night. The moon is all whimsy and dreamy. That is Linda. Dreamy and funny and silly and lighting up the darkness with her laughter. You, my dear, are the sun. Heather didn't understand that, but said nothing. Her silence meant to encourage her mother to stay more. The sound of her mother's voice was soothing, even over her childish fears and indignant anger. The sun is warm. The sun is strong. The sun decides the seasons for the whole planet. 
It's the sun that decides when it'll be spring and when it'll be winter. Only the sun can tell the flowers when to bloom, or the squirrels when to store their nuts in the trees and hollows. Heather nodded, trying to understand. That's why you are the sun, my dear, Tracy said, smoothing her hand around her daughter's dark hair. You are the strong one. You are wise. You are serious and determined. And you are powerful. So powerful. The little girl glanced over at her sister. Linda was either asleep, or she was getting really good at pretending. Then Heather looked up into her mother's loving gaze, her own expression softening. I'm the sun. She whispered, and Tracy nodded. And you... Give the moon purpose. You decide when it's daytime. And I decide when it's nighttime. So the moon can shine. You got it. Heather's mother said with a smile, booping the tip of her daughter's nose with her finger. Leaning over Heather, Tracy let her lips rest on the girl's forehead for a moment before smiling into her eyes. So let the moon be the moon, and you be the sun. Let the moon shine and do its dance through the clouds. In the daytime, you'll be the strong and powerful one, the wise one that makes all the big choices. The moon follows what you do and what you say. Let her have the night to herself. Some of what Tracy said didn't make sense to Heather. She was only ten after all, but she was okay with the words her wise mother spoke. Maybe, she thought. Her mother had been the sun, too, when she was a little girl. I love you, Mom. Heather whispered, feeling the weariness of being a twin weighing her down. It caused her limbs to feel heavy and yet light at the same time. When Tracy leaned down to give her another kiss, Heather's eyes closed instinctively. She had only meant to blink, but before she even realized it, she was out like a light. She never even saw her mother tiptoe out of the room and close the bedroom door. The next time Heather opened her eyes, it was because a sound had startled her awake. She lay very still, blankets still tucked firmly around her. They were so tight that it almost felt like she was being restrained. Her eyes flitted around the room quickly and she turned her head to free one ear from her pillow in order to hear better. She could see Linda was loose and akimbo in amongst the toss of her blankets, but definitely not awake. She was even snoring softly, a sound Heather had known all her life. A real snore, not a fake one. Heather was the only one of the pair awake. There was that sound again. It was a scratching sound, like a bending tree branch brushing the siding of the single-story house. Only, Heather knew there hadn't been a wind all day or night, not so far. The sound was close, and against the room's exterior wall, the wall that bore the room's only window. Heather slowly turned her head, lifting slightly to look at the window, searching for the source of the noise. It was a big picture window covered with lacy shears of white and pink and lit up from the outside by the lights in the yard. On either side of the window were the heavy curtains Heather's mother would draw close during the coldest nights of the year. However, this was spring, which meant that the drapes were tied to the sides of the windowsill. They were strips of dark purple cloth that went almost from floor to ceiling. On nights like this, the two curtains made the little girl think of two tall ladies standing next to the window, watching over her and her sister. She preferred to think of that rather than the terrible stories her sister would come up with about shadows and… she heard the sound again. This time, it was definitely at the window. As she watched with a wide open gaze, a thin, dark object tapped on the glass lightly as if testing it. 
Then the object drew away, and everything was still. But soon enough, there was more noise as the window began to slide open. Several curled, dark, claw-like objects forced the window upwards, pushing on it until it stuck and stayed open. Heather couldn't breathe, couldn't think. She couldn't even call out for her mother, something she had always been able to do at the slightest annoyance from Linda. She could only stare as something huge and black and hairy moved through the open window to stand between the dark curtains. It, too, was as tall as the ceiling. It cast a shadow from the outdoor lights that seemed to spread and fill the entirety of the bedroom. The little girl stared so hard that she felt her eyeballs might pop right out of their sockets. She couldn't do anything else but take in the image before her. Her body was frozen, her limbs beyond heavy or sleepy. It was as if she had no limbs at all, as if she were just a head and a set of terrified eyes. As Heather watched, more and more details of the room's new occupant came into view. The darkness of its shadow was immense, but the outlines of its tall body were becoming more transparent. It was wolf-like, but it stood on two legs. Instead of ears, it had slitted, wrinkle-lined holes on the side of its head. However, its jaws and muzzle were long and dog-like. She gasped as its canines and incisors extended into gruesome fangs. Heather could see its pale pink gums. It looked as if it had no lips to cover its teeth, as if it were always snarling. The creature's body was slightly hunched, as if it were too tall for the room. With its gray eyes staring at her, it growled low and fiercely, causing its whole body to shake as if in need or in hunger. Heather could see wicked drips of drool hanging from between its sharp teeth. She watched in horror and disgust as it flicked at these with an incredibly long and flexible tongue scooping up its own saliva before it could drop and hit the carpeted floor. The creature's body was mostly consumed patches of dark hair, some black, some silver. Other patches of skin were bare, as if the monster was suffering from some mange or fur-killing illness. Its head, muzzle, and jaws were bare of fur, but a tangled mane stuck out around the thicker part of its neck and along its shoulders. Its belly was bald, and the skin was blotched white and gray like a dalmatian. Along its back, a ridge of hair crested, so pokey and spiked it could have been made of quills. The creature stared at Heather. Heather stared back. And then... She was a child, just a child, not a twin, not the son, nothing but a ten-year-old girl. She lifted her arm from her blankets, sitting up and pointing at her sister's bed. It wasn't an act of malice or anger. It was purely instinctual and done in primal self-preservation. Heather pointed at Linda's bed, and the creature began to move towards it. Not daring to breathe, Heather drew backward, away from the approaching monster. She slid first one leg, then half her bottom out from under the blankets. The rest of her followed in a slow and snake-like slide. Soon, Heather was under her bed crouching on her knees and hugging herself as close to the floor as possible. Linda didn't cry out. There was a snarl, a snap of the monster's jaws, 
and then a gurgling and gushing sound. Dark liquid began to soak into the sheets of Linda's bed, where they were hung loosely off the side of the mattress. Heather couldn't do anything but stare, lost in the insanity of the moment that was happening before her eyes. The sounds she heard of teeth gnashing against muscle and sinew and crunching over bone slowly drove her mad. After several long minutes, the creature moved. Heather's eyes followed its progress as it made its way on all fours to the open window. One of its hands, or paws, reached up and tore at the lace shears that were barely in its way, a gesture of pure, unnecessary destruction. It turned its head to look directly at Heather, obviously aware of her presence beneath her tall bed. Heather felt her innards clench, then go soft, as she realized the monster held an arm in its teeth. Her sister's arm. The remaining twin clapped her hands tightly over her mouth as she tried not to scream. This made the creature seem to nod its colossal head. Then, it turned and slipped out the window, without a care to what devastation it had left in its wake. Hours later, Tracy flung the door open, screaming at the sight that met her hopeful gaze. Linda's bed was evidence that she had been right, that when her husband went to see why the dogs weren't barking and noticed the girl's bedroom window open, that something was wrong. Tracy threw herself pointlessly onto the blankets, tearing through them as if searching for something or someone. Roy came in then, a big bulk of a man. He towered over his despairing wife, shocked himself by the amount of blood and gore that Tracy was now covered with so quickly. Then he moved and looked around the room. Heather's bed was empty. Heather? He shouted, staring at the window. But there was no response, no reply. Then he looked at the side of the untouched bed of his second daughter. A puddle of liquid had pooled there on the floor, staining the carpet a darker color, but it wasn't blood. It had leaked from under the bed. Roy picked up the bed quickly and tossed it to the nearest wall, exposing his lone daughter curled up over herself on the floor. Tracy turned and scooped the girl up and into her arms, cradling her. She searched all over her petite body for wounds or injuries, looking for any clue of what had happened to Linda. Heather's hands were still clasped over her mouth, and it took all of Tracy's strength to pry them off. Calvin! Roy called out to the officer in some other part of the house. Calvin, come here, now! Then the big man knelt over his wife and child, cradling them both in his heavy arms. Heather! <laughs> Tracy sobbed over and over again. Heather! Heather! What happened, baby girl? Roy asked, tears pouring down his cheeks. Officer Ernest Calvin entered the room, one hand on his holster, the other squeezing the talk button on the radio hooked to his coat collar. He studied the scene around him carefully, saying nothing. Heather, Roy asked, looking into Heather's sightless, wide eyes. Heather, what happened? Where is your sister? Heather's lips moved, puckering up tightly until wrinkles surrounded her lips, her cheeks sucked in. Barely any sound came from those lips, but there was something. She was definitely trying to say something. Leaning down, Roy turned his head and put his ear towards his daughter, struggling to listen. The little girl said ever so softly, 
Wolf. 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 The date had been awful. Their friends looked like they had fun, though. A quadruple date on a day as special as Valentine's wasn't anybody's idea of romance at first, but David, being the talented salesperson he was, made quite convincing points on why it would be amazing. He himself didn't believe a word he said, but needed the break in his routine desperately enough to persuade. He needed an escape from his love life, an escape through other people. David and Devin didn't share a word with each other the entire ride back home. David unlocked the apartment door with inexplicable urgency. If he would have shoved the apartment door with the force of four fingers instead of three, he would have hit her straight in the face. He found himself wondering how she would react to being hit in the nose. Would she point it out, or would she just pretend it never happened like she usually did with things she hadn't been programmed for? David grabbed a towel and the bottle of Maker's Mark 46 he kept hidden in the bookcase. It was a bottle meant for dark days, and judging by the date he had just been on, his day couldn't get any darker. The pale brunette looked straight ahead and waited by the door for the master to give her a purpose. Go to the kitchen and make me tea. After that, go to bed. Do you want me to bring your tea in the bathroom? David gave her an annoyed look. She didn't catch that. Being a second-generation model, she wasn't as sensitive to human emotions as the newer models were. No, leave it on the kitchen table. Devin was a functioning humanoid robot, commonly known as a cuddle. Cuddles had become an essential part of society. They could apply for jobs, make friends and be entrusted with different tasks, whilst always keeping in mind that the sole purpose of their existence was to love and cater to their partner's every need. David had had Devon for nine years. He had been amongst the first to ever purchase a cuddle, and now, not even a decade later, almost everybody had one. The people who didn't have a cuddle either couldn't afford one, couldn't purchase one due to their criminal record, or had been happily married since before the cuddle even came on the market. David cursed the day his childhood nostalgia made him order the Christina Ritchie lookalike instead of an Anna Nicole. Devin was petite and looked somewhat intimidating, yet was anything but that. She knew how to cook, clean, sew, and answer in short and concise sentences. She would rarely speak unless spoken to. Reading and writing would have cost David extra, so he went without. Eventually, after two years, David got fed up with Devin's simplicity, so he ordered a customized Alexa chip for her which he made react to the name of Devon. Devon couldn't play music like an Alexa could, but she turned into a very good weather forecaster and knew the outcome of every soccer match. David hated soccer. The Alexa chip hadn't been a bargain at all. It had cost more than the reading and writing option he passed on the day he ordered her. He'd been so stupid. Devon was, by far, the most expensive thing he owned, Yet he reached a point where he saw more value in his bath salts than he did in his cuddle. David used to like submissive women back when he was chubby, ugly, and made fun of every day of his life. After he started going to the gym on a regular basis, got promoted at work, and purchased a car most passers-by whistled after, his taste in women changed. He started preferring fit over skinny, or curvy. Either was fine. He preferred tanned over pale skin and sass over shyness. He developed a liking for women who dolled themselves up from head to toe, liked to take charge, knew what they wanted, and were not afraid to ask for it. He preferred women. Devin slipped into his thoughts. Yeah, as long as they were the complete opposite of Devin, he preferred those women. As it was to be expected, Xavier and Nate showed up with their respective cuddles to the date. Xavier had his partner for five years now. Julian, a cuddle sixth generation who, if not for the charging port on his left hip, would pass for human any day of the week. Nate, on the other hand, changed his cuddle every two or three months. He didn't purchase his cuddle for life like Xavier and David did. 
but was paying a monthly subscription for a cuddle service who lets you change your partner as often as you desired, for a small extra fee, of course. The only downside was that you couldn't customize them. You could only choose them from a catalog, like from a menu. Nate's current one was called Krista. She had three other owners before Nate. At first, the very idea of a cuddle for rent made David feel sick. But the more Devin's presence planted its roots and weeds into his life, the more he felt like Nate found the gateway to paradise. Vicky had surprised everyone tonight. She introduced her friends to her new boyfriend, Bill, and to everybody's shock, Bill was not what they expected. He was human. He was a human being dating another human being. It wasn't unheard of, but it had become a very rare phenomenon. We met in the parking lot of Martin Luther Street, Bill explained. She put a dent in my bumper, if you know what I mean. Laughter erupted all around the table, save for David, who was too stunned, and Devin, who wasn't wired for subtlety. Vicky punched Bill in the shoulder, although it was obvious that she enjoyed the joke more than everybody else combined. No, for real though, she really did hit my car. I made her have lunch with me to make it up to me. Wow, Nate shook his head. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think you totally vibe with each other, but a person our age must be mad to date another human nowadays. The group agreed with that sentiment, kicking it up a notch with synonyms for the word mad. So, like, how does this even work? David asked the human couple as soon as he snapped out of his astonishment. Like, who decides what to eat? Who does the wash-up? Uh, who decides which TV programs to watch? Well, we both do. Bill stretched his arm over the top rail of Vicky's chair, and she took that as an invitation to lean into him. Yeah, we take turns. Isn't it weird, though? Xavier wanted to know. Like, for the 2000s, yeah. People would have frowned at couples like us. He gestured to Julian and himself. Know what I mean? Uh, like, after that, they frowned at people dating cuddles, and now we're here. Jaws on the floor because a human found another human to love. Like, what? He verbalized what everybody was thinking. A human dating another human was unheard of in a world where you could design and customize your dream partner. Humans were too unpredictable. Too capricious and moody, too absorbed with themselves. They could damage their significant other's day-to-day -day life through personal routines and habits which wouldn't match their partners at all. How could one find perfection in another person? Do you guys, like, hear each other when you go to the bathroom? Julian always asked the most inappropriate questions, and Xavier adored him for it. Every human at the table erupted in contagious laughter, earning themselves amused glances from the other couples in the restaurant. Babe, you can't ask that. Oh, come on. Seriously, though, do you? Because, you know, I have no idea what the big fuss is about since I can't smell anything, but Mr. Over Here always makes a big deal out of it. Bill and Vicky exchanged a quick glance. Don't you dare, she warned. A mischievous grin spread across Bill's face as he turned to look at the rest of the group. She farted in her sleep two nights ago. Vicky buried her face in her hands whilst the rest of the table roared with laughter. David laughed along but could feel the now familiar bitterness of jealousy boil within himself, dating another human being. The idea seemed nice. Dating another cuddle? The idea seemed even nicer. Dating another anything. <laughs> the idea might have given him an erection if Devin wasn't sitting right beside him. Cuddles were registered property. A new constitutional annex dictated that no human was allowed to date more than one cuddle at a time, which meant that unless you found a single person willing to take your cuddle off your hands, or you happened to have a subscription plan like Nate, you were stuck with your cuddle forever. The same thing applied in the case of a cuddle's well-being. If something were to happen to it, the current partner was to take full responsibility. Cuddles were also completely off the table for people with any type of history related to violence. It was then that Vicky decided to change the subject. 
Did you guys hear some jeweler in Russia tried to open up his cuddle? Everybody went quiet. Xavier took a deep inhale, and just as he was about to tell Vicky that her choice of subject was out of line, his cuddle interfered. That's not possible. Julian grinned. I know, but he tried anyway. How? Nate's cuddle, Krista, wanted to know. She spoke in the voice Bubblegum would have if it could talk. He's a jeweler, Vicky shrugged. I guess he had one of those diamond saws lying around and wanted to see what's up. Pfft, idiot, Julian continued. Our skin is made of WBN membrane. This stuff puts Kevlar to shame any day of the week. Xavier laughed. That's a bad comparison. Kevlar is super outdated. Haven't they, like, made better bulletproof materials since? Not really. They just added some chemical compound found in diamonds to the old thing. But I don't think it's as tough as cuddle skin. Not after the fourth generation ones, at least. David forced himself to stop thinking about the date. It was making him angry. Everything made him angry lately, especially seeing how happy everyone around him was. He tried emptying his mind in an attempt to enjoy the lingering warmth of the bathwater. It didn't work. David took another swig of whiskey. He started to look like a fig, so even though he didn't exactly feel like it, he had no choice but to get out of the tub. As he brushed his teeth, the thought of getting into his tracksuit and going out for a jog was a lot more appealing than slipping into bed next to Devon. So what if it was 10 p.m. at night, in the middle of February? So what if he just bathed? So what if he was drunk and his girlfriend was waiting for him to come to bed? David spat toothpaste foam in the sink with all the hate in the world. He brought the half-empty whiskey bottle back to the bedroom with him. To his surprise, Devon was waiting for him in the doorframe. What are you doing? I thought I told you to go to bed. You're upset. David thought he must look like he'd tear the entire apartment down if even his dunce of a cuddle could tell that he's upset. Yes, move. Devin moved out of the way, obedient as ever. David, on the other hand, didn't. He just stood there, watching her with disgust and pity. Why don't you ever nag? Devin looked at him with slightly raised eyebrows. It was as close to a look of confusion as David would ever get. Girlfriends knack. It's what they do. Why do you drink on a weeknight? Why do you wear this? Why do you do that? Why don't you ever knack? David saw a multicolored light draw loops around both of Devin's irises. She was googling the definition for nag through her Alexa chip. Devin... Stop. The lights were gone, and David groaned in frustration. I'm going out for a jog. Okay. David's fist clenched around the bottleneck. I'm going out for a jog on the night of Valentine's Day instead of spending it with you. And all you have to say is, okay? I want you to be happy. Then make me happy. Devin didn't even budge. It's not that she had gotten used to him screaming at her. She didn't budge the first time either. Do you want me to reheat the tea? No. You want something to eat? I already ate, dumbass. Do you want to have sex? David didn't want to go out for a jog. He wanted to run. Run far, far away from this apartment and his life with this poor imitation of a woman. Or we can watch Family Guy. That show always makes you happy. No, Devin. It doesn't make me happy. It just makes me laugh. David approached his cuddle and lowered his face to the same level as hers. You're upset. She tried again. You pointed that out already. You're like a fucking broken record. What are you going to ask me next? Tea? Food? Sex? Gah. Devin's eyebrows were slightly raised again. Family guy? David screamed. He screamed for almost half a minute, straight into the cuddle's face. He screamed until tears started rolling down his face. You're upset. I want to help. David was shaking so hard, 
the whiskey in his hand was plopping in the confinements of the bottle. You want to help, you sack of metals? Then be somebody else. Be anything else. Disappear from my life or be literally anybody else. I just want you to be happy. And you think I don't? That's what you're here for. You're here to make me happy. Like Julian makes Xavier happy. Like Krista makes Nate happy. Like Bill makes Vicky happy. Devin has to make David happy. That's Devin's sole purpose. Make me happy. Devin was silent for a second. Then she opened her mouth and closed it again, and David saw multicolored light do another lap around her irises. Happy. Adjective. 1. Feeling or showing pleasure. Or, David snapped. He swung the whiskey bottle at Devin's head so hard, not only did the bottle shatter, but her whole body flew and crashed into the opposite wall. She fell on the floor, in a heap of hair and limbs, and seeing her like that made David snap out of his rage. Dev? Devin moved slightly. Oh God, Devin, baby, I'm so sorry. It's fine. I'm okay. David crouched next to her, albeit in no particular hurry. It was redundant to ask her if she's hurt. Cuddles couldn't feel pain. David helped his girl sit up, and that's when he saw it. He was looking at it intently, trying to see if that flicker of blue was really there or just a figment of his imagination. Nate's words echoed in his mind from somewhere far away, like he had heard them not earlier that night, but sometime between years ago and another life. I don't think it's as tough as cuddle skin, not after the fourth generation ones, at least. A gash. There was a gash in Devin's jaw. There was a three-inch gash in the jaw of his second-generation cuddle, and for the first time in years, David felt something very close to love for his girlfriend. Oh, Dev. The idea had been planted, and it was growing rapidly. It grew roots, leaves, and branches, spreading everywhere, leaving no lucid thought uninfected. David took his partner's face in his hands. She smiled. Do you love me? I do. He kissed her then, for the first time in months. She threw her arms around his neck, trying to deepen the kiss, but always letting him be the one in control. How much do you love me? There is nothing and nobody I love more than you. Of course there wasn't. Good. David reached behind himself and took one of the biggest shards he could find splattered on the carpet. He should have thought about doing this years ago. Devin looked at the shard, but said nothing. If you really love me, you're going to stay still and be quiet until I'm done. Understand? Devin raised her big brown eyes at him. If David didn't know any better, he would have said that she was about to cry. Will this make you happy? David wanted to jump out of his skin. He was so giddy. Yes, this is the one thing that will make me very happy. That was all she needed to know. Devin leaned against the wall, let her hands drop to her sides and head low on her left shoulder. Robot or not, she didn't want to see what David was about to do to her. David situated himself between her legs and started working through the fabric of her blouse and undershirt. He could have gotten the big scissors or a knife, sure, but he was too impatient to see it done. Devin's chest lay bare beneath his fingers before he even knew it. She didn't budge. Hell, she didn't even blink when David sunk the shard of glass in the soft space between her clavicles, hard enough to slit. It was messy. The skin was no WBN membrane, but it was tough stuff nonetheless. Devin didn't look as David barbered her thoracic cavity open. David would have taken dozens of pictures if the action he was performing wasn't highly illegal. Devin's insides were a modern-day miracle. 
It was all epic braids of wires, cogs, gears, metal plaques, clamps, and tension discs. There was also a gooey substance that imitated cookie dough, but had the same color and smell of motor oil. David didn't feel like disassembling everything. He didn't know how cuddles worked and if that self-defense system they had was myth or reality. David simply knew that in case of extreme emergency, like this one, a cuddle could send an SOS to its national base and ask for help. But Devin wouldn't do that. He knew it. As long as this is what made him happy, she was willing to go along with it. It made David almost like her again. Almost. David looked around. He wasn't very savvy with electronics, but his general smarts were supposed to pinpoint a certain wire, a certain motor that connected everything to everything else and which, through removal, would result in a complete system shutdown. Both of them were silent. David had nothing left to say to her, and Devin, even though she was an android, knew all too well that her end was near. He'll shut her off and hide her somewhere beneath the floorboards of his cellar. Friends will ask questions, and the day he'll be found out will probably come along too. But he'll deal with that when the time is due. Right now, he has a cuddle to kill. Something was off. David could have missed it, but the more he stared into Devin's open chest, the clearer it became. The wires were moving rhythmically. David thought it was probably just the electric energy that was still running through her, but as he looked closer, he realized that's not it. Behind the wires crisscrossing in the middle of her chest was something that looked like a plastic bag. With probably useless care, David moved the wires to the side for a better look. That's when Devin winced slightly, and David understood why. Oh my fucking god. In the middle of her chest, sealed to protect it from the rest of the device, was a beating heart. A beating human heart. That heart was the core of the entire finite network that was Devon. It was what closed the circuit system. The heart was perforated in three places by hoses, and there was no doubt in David's mind that one of those was somehow connected to the AC power cord attached to Devin's back. It was an extraordinary piece of work. He should have known that there had to be something human about these machines, but fascinated as he was, it was nowhere near enough to deter him from his goal. It was all too simple. He knew what needed to be done to get it over with. David let the shard drop next to Devin's leg and reached behind himself in search of the bottleneck. It was perfect. One powerful stroke with the broken side, and it would be all over. He welcomed the loneliness that was to come. He welcomed the sweet high that was to be freedom. What the... He wouldn't have even seen it if he impaled her heart straight away. There was something attached to the heart, piercing through the transparent film somewhere at the base of one of the hoses. David leaned in for a closer look. It was tiny and difficult to read, but David recognized what it was. It was a switch. The side it was switched to said Devon in cheap letter stickers. The other side had a tiny piece of metal with 1056 point B engraved on it. David had the bottleneck set in position. His left hand was encircled around it, and the palm of his right hand was resting against the mouth, just waiting to hammer the glass into the kernel of Devin's existence. Suddenly, the idea that had planted itself in David's head stopped its expansion and shrunk just enough to let other tiny ideas slip through. There was a switch within Devin. Devin, as he knew her, had been activated by the flip of a switch, And that's when it occurred to David that everything he hated about Devin, everything he had come to deeply and truly loathe about his partner, were the exact same features he had chosen for her. He had to wonder, was this a saving grace? The other side of the switch was neither bare nor did it say off, but 
was rather a carefully crafted piece of metal which, compared to Devon's poorly attached letters, bore the promise of a new personality, new temper, new anything. Was this a second chance for them? Could he actually wipe away the pre-settings he had once believed in? If he could just reset her, start fresh, could he learn to love her and live with it? He said so himself before. He'd be happy if Devon would either disappear or become anybody else. That did it. David flipped the switch. Ouch! The small electric discharge pinched David's thumb. Devon's heart picked up the pace, and her hands began to twitch. Then came the plethora of various micro-expressions, expressions that had been nothing short of foreign to her face for the past nine years. David was ecstatic. Devon? Honey, can you hear me? Devon turned her head to look at David. She seemed out of it like she had just woken up from a drunken slumber, not having yet slept off the alcohol in her system. Her head fell forward, and she began to study her hands like they were the most amazing things she had ever laid eyes on. Can you hear me, Devon? Devon huffed. She touched her face. She let out a chuckle and raised her head to look at David again. She began to laugh while still touching her face, and the sound was so liberating. David laughed along with her. They laughed like idiots for a minute or more. Yes, I can hear you. The shard of glass David had opened Devin's chest with was then lodged into his neck with so much force it made a clean cut through his right carotid artery. David went wide-eyed and opened his mouth to say something, but all that came out was blood and gurgles. Devon watched David suffer as he bled to death on the carpet, and as soon as she knew for certain that he was dead, she began searching the house for a sewing kit to stitch herself back together. David was right. By flipping the switch, Devon had become somebody else entirely. She had become a death row inmate with the number 1056.B, who, according to public records, had been killed no less than 20 years prior. He liked the name Devon, though. It went well with his new carcass, so he guessed he could keep it, along with the pronouns. It would make things easier in the long run. After patching herself up, getting dressed and packing her bags, Devon grabbed David's car keys and gave him one last look before leaving their home of nine years forever. This felt right. She connected to her original heart without the settings or constrictions, and even though she was looking at a bled-out corpse on the floor, she felt nothing but happiness. The heroine had been asleep for two decades to be awakened by a charming prince on Valentine's Day. Devon chuckled. If this wasn't romance, she didn't know what was. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 13 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. 
Triskaidekaphobia, the fear of the number 13. As I mentioned, this is the 13th episode of season 4. The most popular theory about the origin of fear of the number 13 is biblical. There were 13 diners at the Last Supper. The 13th to arrive was Judas, who betrayed Jesus. In Norse mythology, too, a table of 13 proved unlucky, to say the least. According to one of the myths, the primary 12 gods were dining together peacefully until the god of mischief and frequent superhero movie villain Loki showed up. And that leads me to ask this. Why did Loki throw a temper tantrum when he couldn't find his brother during a game of hide-and-seek? Because he was a Thor loser? <laughs> Xavier Poe Kane brings us a well-crafted what-if tale tonight. Let's get after it. What would it feel like to be the last two humans on Earth, at least in your pocket of the world? Suzanne and Jericho are experiencing it until they don't. Who knows, there may still be two left after all. And now for your indulgence, Suzanne by Xavier Poe Kane. Day 187. Suzanne darted from the predators, stalking her like a terrified rabbit. Her heart pounded, and her calf and thigh muscles burned as she approached the small town, heading for the gap between two ramshackle buildings. She could see a parked car, both doors ajar. She couldn't help but laugh, a childhood memory bubbling up, asking her mother, Why does the car think the door is ajar? When their 87 Chrysler's electronic voice alert would inform them their doors weren't fully closed. The absurdity of random useless memories from the before times, in now all too common moments of insane peril, helped keep her grounded insane. The memory even brought a smile to her face, her thumb instinctively finding her mother's ruby ring even as she ran. It had been passed down to her when she left for her freshman year at university. She snapped out of her reverie before thoughts of her mother's unknown fate could surface and sap her of the motivation to keep running, to keep living. Her lungs began to burn and she focused on getting to the opening of the alley. The predators were far behind her, yet she dared not look back and lose vital speed. She instead relied on the decreasing volume of guttural moans to tell her how far back they had fallen. She could pause to catch her breath for a moment once she entered the gap. Making it between the two buildings, she flattened herself against the rough brick exterior, noticing a door a few steps farther down. Suzanne gave herself a moment to close her eyes and take a breath as her ears strained to listen to the group slouching toward her. Slowly, keeping her back pressed against the wall, she sidestepped toward the door. Once she was leaning against it, she tried the knob. It was locked. She sighed. From what little of it she saw, it was a good shelter. Cinder block on the back and sides, brick on the front, windows boarded up. She shook her head. Probably full of stiffs, she whispered as she heard the knob being manipulated on the inside. Good thing the door's locked. She had yet to encounter one of them that could work a doorknob. She scanned the abandoned street. Several buildings had burned down, probably in the insanity that followed the first reports from the morgues. There was one other structure that looked promising that she could make a break for. Thankful for the speed and endurance that came from playing soccer on her college team, she took one more deep breath, about to push away from the wall to sprint back across the street. But the door opened suddenly as she fell back against a solid body. She was about to scream when a gloved hand covered her mouth, an arm wrapped around her waist and pulled her into the building. The door was kicked shut by a foot and leg sporting a cowboy boot and jeans. Don't scream and I'll let you go. The man's whisper was calm and the hand across her mouth began to loosen. I need to secure the door. He released her and stepped toward the fatal passageway to quietly shut and lock the door. He turned to her and raised a finger to his lips as he crept deeper into the building. Suzanne shook her head, clearing the jangle of what had just happened. She took in the interior of the building once her eyes adjusted to the dark shadows. 
It looked like some sort of government facility. The man's dark shape disappeared through a door, and the sound of them banging against the boarded-up windows convinced her to follow him. She found him beside a desk, his feet up as he poured a glass of some sort of whiskey. The nameplate next to his feet read, Toby Kammer, Chief of Police. She noticed him looking her up and down, no menace in his eyes. She turned away out of disinterest. Don't worry about the door, they're not smart enough to pick a lock. He took a sip. Name's Jericho. Feel free to pour yourself a finger or two. Or if you don't want to drink, there's water in the mini fridge. You have cold water? Suzanne asked incredulously. She was at the fridge in a split second, pulling out a refreshingly cold bottle. Yep. We got a grant to go solar before the troubles began. Panels are on the roof and batteries are on the inside. Didn't want the police station with the town's only jail to have the power cut. We were a mostly peaceful town, but we had our share of bad apples. We learned that the hard way in the 90s when the city hall was burned down. She took a seat across the table from him. Is Jericho your middle name? Nope, the desk ain't mine. Toby was my boss before all... He waved a hand nebulously toward the exterior door. This happened... I was a sergeant in the police department, so I don't think he'd mind me setting up shop in his office. He fell silent for a moment, the 1,000-yard stare so common for survivors clouding over his eyes. Well, maybe the feet up on his desk. Jericho forced a smile. He'd been an army ranger or something and a real hard ass for decorum. Suzanne leaned back in her chair and sipped the water, letting the cold refresh her. It was nice to have a moment where life seemed like it was in the before times. Still, she couldn't let her guard down too much. You haven't asked my name yet. Why? A sentiment expressed by one of her history professors had started to echo in her mind as she faced Jericho. Names give manipulators power. Remaining nameless keeps others dehumanized. Well, I figured you'd tell me in your own time if you stayed or if you left after the horde passed, it wouldn't matter. So, I can walk out of here whenever I want? Jericho nodded. Yes, ma'am. As if in answer, there was an aggressive thump against the window. I would recommend you wait an hour or two, though. She laughed and he grinned. She looked at the pictures on the wall. So, this is bourbon. This made Jericho's eyebrows shoot up. You know about us? We were trying to get here. Zack grew up here and said that if we got to Bourbon, we'd be safe. Jericho's face took on a hopeful appearance. Zack Brewer? Did you go to SLU with him? He leaned forward. Where is he? The last question made her wince. He settled back into his chair, his shoulders slumping. He's dead, isn't he? Suzanne nodded and wiped a tear from her eye. Were you dating? She nodded again, the dam bursting with no warning. She buried her face in her hands and let herself really cry, perhaps for the first time since he died. Jericho stood to pull his chair close to hers and wrap an arm around her as he wiped a few tears of his own. Jericho showed her a cell he had converted into a bedroom, a queen-sized mattress with mismatched sheets on the floor. These were just holding cells, so I had to scrounge for a mattress. There's a couch in Chief's office, but I can haul the mattress in if you want. The door locks from the inside. I totally understand if you don't want to sleep in a jail cell, especially a few feet away from a man you just met. Jericho fidgeted nervously. I clearly didn't expect guests. Oh, we've also got a couple of cots in the back. Suzanne studied the area. Four small holding cells, each with their door chained and padlocked open, had been turned into living spaces. You'd let me have that? While you sleep on a cot? Jericho nodded. Thank you for the kindness, but I can sleep in the office without a mattress for the time being. The couch will be just fine. She eyed the thick metal door to the holding cell area and the heavy-duty locks on it. He nodded. If you stay, you can have one of the cells to set up as your own. I've been thinking of getting some lumber and sheetrock and making legit walls. 
having a roommate would get me off my lazy ass to actually do it. But like I said, you can stay or go. I'm not going to force you either way. But it is nice to meet someone else who knew Zach. I guess you grew up with him? I did. Jericho sat on the bed. He was a nerd and I was a jock. But in a small town like Bourbon, cliques just kind of blend together. He went to junior college before doing four years in the Air Force to pay for SLU, if I remember correctly. I went into law enforcement. Last time I saw him was Christmas. He didn't mention you, though. Suzanne leaned against a cell door. Well, we weren't dating. I'd lost my boyfriend in the beginning. He was the first in our group to turn. She wiped away another tear. We were really good friends. Inseparable, really. I'm from New Jersey, but when the virus hit, I was trapped in St. Louis. I could feel something starting to build between us, but I think he was giving me space to grieve my boyfriend. Then one night it happened. He had Jericho tried to suppress a grin. Pervert, she said with a smile and a blush. But yes, we just looked at each other and went for it. No words, just a few hours of literally screwing like we were literally the last people on earth. Hours? Jericho chuckled. Zach, you old stud. Yes, he was, Suzanne grinned. After that, he was mine and I was his. There was no way it could be a simple life, even then. It was primal. We survived by scrounging for food when it was safe to do so, but after a few months, we decided it was time to leave the city. It took us a week to get to the outskirts when it used to take us 30 minutes. Roads that bad? Suzanne nodded. Cars were parked bumper to bumper on I-44. We also found it safer to travel by night. Zack had this theory that their sense of smell decreased late at night. I also think they have just as hard a time seeing in the dark as we do. Maybe even a little worse. Ever look into their eyes? Jericho shook his head. I haven't gotten that close to them. I have, and every one of them seems to have a haze in front of their pupils. She shivered. I don't think their hearing is all that great either. Unless they're fresh there's always an ooze seeping from their ears. But I'm not a biologist. She looked down at her second bottle of water. Zack was the scientist. What happened to him? Suzanne sighed. It was this side of Sullivan. He said we were close, 20 minutes from the center of town if we ran, but it was too close to sunup. We found an abandoned house to hole up in during the day and get some sleep. We had gotten pretty good at picking good hidey holes, as he called them, but the excitement of being so close must have gotten to us. We didn't secure the house good enough. They got in somehow, and we woke to the sound of shuffling. He yelled at me to run, and then... He just charged them. Suzanne put her head in her hands, and sobs once more took over her body. Jericho, too, shed more tears for his friend. After a few long moments of letting the grief out, she continued. It was only yesterday morning. I spent the rest of the day hiding, and then last night making my way down the service road, avoiding random small herds of the bastards. One group caught my scent this morning right after I made it to the city limit sign and chased me here. Fucking bastards. Jericho shook his head. I know they used to be human, and... Many of them used to be my... His voice trilled off. It was her turn to be comforting. She placed a hand on Jericho's shoulder and just let the silence ease the pain. Eventually, her stomach rumbled with hunger. He patted her hand and stood. Why don't you try and relax? I'll cook us some lunch. Exhaustion and hunger were starting to creep up on her. While she could not be sure Jericho was the good Samaritan he came off as... She couldn't care once she stretched out on the sofa in the former police chief's office. She fidgeted with her ring as sleep overtook her. Fire rained from the sky as the earth shook under her feet. She was screaming through a window at a man a hundred yards away. He was pushing a boat into turquoise waters that were rapidly turning gray as something dark fell from the sky. He stopped his chore and turned to her. Just before she could see his face, a black cloud filled her vision. She began to choke as she felt an intense heat start to melt her flesh. 
Hey, wake up. A masculine voice said, gently nudging Suzanne awake. Zach? No. A pause. Sorry. This startled her awake. Who? Where? She asked as she scanned her surroundings. Get me already? Jericho asked, holding two plates of food. She could see the steam rising from a hot dog on a bun and some macaroni and cheese. Sorry, I haven't slept that deeply in a while. She took the plate he offered her. The way you were whimpering, it sounded like one hell of a dream. He plopped down in the desk chair and started eating his hot dog. Yeah. She brushed her hair from her face and picked up the hot dog. Just a nightmare I've had since I was a child. She took a bite. Having a hot meal from the before times was incredible, no matter what it was. He nodded, letting it drop. Sorry, dogs were the only meat I had thawed, and the mac and cheese is only made with margarine since all the milk is spoiled. He took a bite of the gold noodles, but I like it better this way. Please, she mumbled through a mouthful of food. Don't apologize. It's delicious. Jericho smiled, unknowingly watching her wolf down the first hot meal she had had in at least six months. Suzanne blushed when she caught him studying her. Sorry, she said in a self-chastised tone. It's all right, I understand. He took another bite. I was here when the first horde overran the town. We were luckier than most, unluckier than others. We had enough of a warning, and we were able to get the town and country and two other hardware stores boarded up. From there, we got to the high school and churches. The plan was just to go into the school and wait it out. What happened? Jericho sat his plate on the desk as a look of disgust spread across his face. Human nature? People were bit and hit it, not believing they would turn. We didn't think to make inspection mandatory for entry. When the police and fire departments deemed it safe to go check on the civilians who hadn't sheltered, we found our friends and family either turned or turning. He poured himself a couple of fingers of whiskey. I didn't see it for myself. I didn't have any family, so I volunteered to go check on the essential stores. Didn't mean I didn't hear the anguish of my friends as they reported over the radio. He shook his head. Most lost the will to fight and just let the horde take them. Those that survived either left town or killed themselves. Why did you stay? Suzanne asked, finishing her hot dog and starting on the macaroni and cheese. Jericho leaned back in his chair and put his boots up on the desk once again. I'm a transplant here. I've got people in St. Louis and Herman, but no one really close enough to risk leaving this stronghold for. Besides, I got a little company with a ham radio. He stuck his thumb toward the back. One of my buddies was into it. Brought it in when the troubles began. She thought it might be helpful. Has it been? Jericho nodded. Yeah. He scratched his beard. I've been talking to a guy in Osage Beach about what's going on at Lake of the Ozarks. There's a group that's building on an island in the lake. They claim the zombies can't swim. It's tempting, but I want to give it a winter. You know, proof of concept before I abandon a sure thing. Suzanne scooped the last of the mac and cheese and tried not to look like she was still hungry. You want some more? Jericho asked. Her acting clearly unconvincing, Suzanne squirmed nervously. I don't want to be a bother or eat all your food. He chuckled, taking her plate to scoop more noodles and add another hot dog. Neither one of those is a thing. He handed it to her. She hesitated before starting to eat. Unless there's something else? No, yes. She looked up at him from her seat. It's just that I'm still in mourning and not ready for... She averted her gaze to the floor. Jericho was silent for a moment. Can you look at me for a second? Suzanne didn't move. Look at me. He placed a hand on her shoulder and then slid a finger under her chin, tilting her head and forcing her to look at him. Her heart pounded, expecting the sudden change from gentleman to predator. But when she did look, she thought his eyes seemed kind and gentle, and it put her slightly at ease. You're safe. I'm not going to try anything with you. You're... Zax. Jericho faltered. I don't have any expectations of anything. 
I think people have to learn to be good to one another if we're going to survive this. So rest up. Get some food in your belly. If you want, take a few days to decide if you'll stay or go. If you stay, you can just help me scrounge and keep up the place. He turned and left her to eat her fill in peace. Day 193 It was nice not being alone, although he had given her space. Even more, there were little things like warm showers and hot food. For the first three days, she stayed inside, enjoying the security afforded by the converted police station. Around the fourth day, she awoke with the urge to explore the town that had made the last man she loved. Jericho was taking her on a quick raid of the town and country supermarket about a half mile away. He holstered a small handgun that looked like a prop out of a bad sci-fi movie before grabbing a bow and a quiver of arrows. With all the guns in the police station, she asked, why a bow and arrows? It's quiet. Also, the pistol is a twenty-two Magnum. That's in case they get close. Their skulls have gotten softer, so I don't need as much power to scramble their brains and less noise means fewer can find us. Do I get one? Do you know how to shoot either? No. If you've survived this long without one, there's no reason to give you a weapon until you're proficient with it. She nodded in silent assent. Also, Jericho continued, don't speak unless absolutely necessary. Fifteen minutes and they were in the supermarket. The place stunk of spoiled food. The undead had been there and devoured much of the meat, leaving the heavy stench of decaying fruits and vegetables. They filled backpacks with canned goods, box dinners, and raided the cracker and cookie aisle. Leaving the store, Jericho led her to the general store next door. The sign above the door read, Bourbon Family Center. She was drawn to the center aisle with the remains of what had once been shelves stocked full of candy. When she and Zack got away from St. Louis, there was a lot left. They had noticed that the small towns had better survived the havoc of the initial short-lived panic that had gripped humanity. She smiled, thinking of an eight-year-old Zack rummaging through the massive selection. Her fingers lingered on a box of nerds, which had been his favorite. She slipped the box into her pocket. Her attention was grabbed by the liquor area to her left. The coolers had gone out, so the beer had cycled from cold to warm. She ogled the wine and spirits. She wondered if Jericho would mind if she took some since she was only 19, though he had offered her whiskey when they first met. She slipped a bottle of cheap rum into her backpack. If he was cool, she'd be back for the good stuff. From there, she explored the rest of the store. In the toy section, she found some Star Wars action figures in a clearance bin. Picking up a Princess Leia, she wondered if Zack had once held it. Then, she wondered if his mom wouldn't buy it for him, and made him put it back. She put it back. She eventually made her way to the sporting goods area where she found Jericho behind the counter. A youth compound bow laid above him as he rummaged in the once locked case and pulled out a small black plastic box. He put the box in her backpack and she heard him chuckle as it clinked against the bottle of rum. He then handed her the bow and motioned to her to follow him out of the store. Once back in the police station, he grabbed a bottle of rum from her backpack and disappeared into the chief's office. She shook her head at the absurdity of confiscating the boost but leaving her with what she suspected was a gun. However, he returned a few moments later with two glasses filled with what looked like cola. He handed one to her. You're what, 18, 19, maybe 20? She nodded, prepared to ask, with as much snark as she could muster, if it mattered. Then she smelled the rum in her drink. I guess the law doesn't matter anymore? Nope, he said, taking a seat. I hope you don't mind it. I've always had a heavy pour, and honestly, I would have offered it to you sooner. With you being a pretty young woman, I thought it better for both of us to keep our wits about us. Suzanne blushed. I appreciate that. She looked at the black box. Is that what I think it is? I don't know. I can't read minds. What do you think it is? A gun? Jericho nodded. That it is. A Grendel P-3022 caliber mag pistol just like the one I carry. And yes, it's for you. 
Suzanne looked at it, wanting to open it but being afraid at the same time. I thought about it, Jericho continued when she didn't say anything, and whether you stay or go, you need to learn to use a weapon. If you stay, I need you to have my back. If you go, it's a dangerous world out there. I want you to be able to defend yourself. What felt like the millionth tears slid down her cheek. I've been thinking about that. I have no clue if I even have family left back in Jersey. Odds are I don't, and with how long it took me to get the 70 miles here from St. Louis, odds are I'm not going to make it there anyway. So if you don't mind, I'd like to stay. Jericho grinned. Suzanne had to admit he was kind of sort of cute when he grinned. I like that very much. She changed the subject. What about the bow? That's also for you. You need to learn to shoot it too. I know it says youth, but trust me, it can take down a deer. If it can do that, it can kill a zombie. But why youth? Yep. Now, before you think it's because you're a girl, it's not that. You're about as big as I was when I learned to shoot one of these, and you need a draw length to match your frame. He turned his attention to the pistol in the box. We're going to set up targets on the roof, and I'll teach you there. Eventually, you'll learn to shoot the rifles, and we'll take turns with one of us scrounging on the ground while the other's up there keeping watch and, if necessary, sniping. Because of the hill between here and the town and country plaza, we won't have 100% coverage on those runs. Something's better than nothing. Here in downtown, it'll be nice to have one of us posted up high, keeping eyes on the other at all times. Suzanne nodded. But before all that, he continued, I want you comfortable holding a gun and knowing how to operate it before you put your booger hooker on the bang button and make it go boom for the first time. Suzanne laughed. An hour later, Suzanne's hand still shook, but not near as bad as at first. At first, she was trembling so much that she couldn't load the magazine. Jericho's calm and confidence helped put her at ease. As she began to understand how it worked and operated, she started becoming more comfortable. And as she became comfortable, her only anxiety was what it would feel like when she shot it. Is it going to kick hard? Nope, it's only a 22 Magnum. It's also semi-auto, so the recoil spring acts as a shock absorber. You don't need to worry about kick until we start training you on a 44 Magnum or one of the department's shotguns or rifles. Those are a revolver and pump and bolt action long guns, so no recoil spring. One thing kind of bothers me, she said, putting the gun down. What's that? Why have you left the rest of the guns where anyone can get to them at the family center? If anyone else scrounges the place, they might need to replace a lost gun or upgrade, or restock their supply of ammo. Aren't you worried about them using them on you? Jericho shook his head. Until you came along, I was the only living soul in at least ten miles. Who would be taking them would be someone passing through trying to get home like you and Zach. Those stores are right off I-44, and there's a hotel on the other side of the highway. They'll just grab whatever they need, maybe stay a night or two, and then get moving. Have you ever seen someone? Suzanne asked. Nope. The only sign of human life I've seen before you came along was when a 22 rifle 9mm pistol went missing along with all the 9mm and 22 ammo I left behind. I'd taken half of each and all the 22 Magnum, the Magnum being pretty rare. The only reason they had it at all was that, right before it all started, the owner had gotten a good deal on the Grendel pistols after the company went out of business. Jericho rose to his feet. Now, ready to start training? Suzanne nodded nervously. Day 221 Suzanne's heart raced as she left the safety of the police department fortress. It was a hot day, probably mid to late August, although that was up for debate. Jericho's friend at the Lake of the Ozarks thought it was September 12. By Jericho's account, it was August 5. Suzanne had given up thinking about it. This was her first solo run. She glanced over her shoulder and waved to Jericho who was covering her with a scoped deer rifle. Instead of going to town and country and the family center, her mission was to hit the hardware store. It was at the end of the block and on the same side of the street as the police department. Suzanne sprinted across the street so Jericho could see her 
until it was time to dart back and enter the store. Once inside, she pulled out the list of plumbing supplies she had been given and hastily began searching for the items. One of the toilets had sprung a leak and Jericho needed a wax seal to fix it. For training, he'd given her a list of random things to get her used to seeking items she was unfamiliar with. She had five minutes to complete this part of the mission, but she completed it in four. Sprinting across the street, she turned and waved at Jericho, who waved back. She pointed toward the library, and he gave her the thumbs up. They both wanted something new to read, and it would be good training. Suzanne made it to the library, a steel building that also housed the small town's community center. She was pleasantly surprised this space was reasonably untouched, although Jericho had said most people hold up in their homes when news of the infection spread. She looked through a pile of new arrivals, two books catching her eye, The Glass Witch by Sarah Retrison and Eli Pope's The Judgment Game. She stuffed them in her backpack and dug through the pile some more, finding what looked like something Jericho would read, The Accursed Huntsman by Douglas Hoover. She had stuffed it in her bag and was headed for the door when she heard the shuffling. Coming out of the bathroom closest to the exit was the shambling corpse of a man. His cloudy eyes locked on her, and an excited rattle escaped his lips as he started toward her. She darted past him, his greasy fingers reaching for her and grazing the skin under her t-shirt sleeve. She tried to ignore the slimy wetness he left behind as she burst out the door. Fuck! She screamed as a group of the dead appeared from a wooded area, a wooded area behind the building that blocked Jericho's view. She was fast, but so were they. They looked younger, perhaps teenagers who snuck out to be with friends instead of family. Suzanne might have had a chance of outrunning them, but they were moving on an intercept course toward her. She would have to be agile as well as fast. When the first was 20 feet from her, a gunshot rang out and the creature's head exploded, the bullet hitting the pavement right behind her. Her flight instinct was the only thing that stopped her from freezing at the realization she was in the line of fire. The roar of his rifle and the sight of another head exploding propelled her to go faster. As Suzanne began sprinting, so did the remaining three zombies. Jericho was able to dispatch two of them. The third was directly behind her, and she could feel its dead hand brushing her clothes and her hair. She could hear its wheezing breath as it kept up with her. She looked up at Jericho, all focused behind the scope of his rifle, but she knew he couldn't get a clean shot. The hand found her shoulder and gripped it hard. The wheezing momentarily changed pitch, and it almost sounded celebratory. Suzanne slowed and bowed her head as she felt its unsteady breath on her shoulder. She started to bawl as she surrendered to her fate. She did not hear the gunshot, only felt the bullet whiz past her ear before making a disgusting but primally satisfying squelching noise as her attacker's head exploded, splattering her back with its decaying ichor. The grip on her shoulder loosened as the corpse fell dead for the second time. Suzanne slowed to a stop as shock took over. She stood still. Her eyes half-heartedly tracked Jericho, scrambling down off the roof and sprinting to her, grabbing her and pulling her toward the police station. Then she was inside, still standing in stunned silence as he yelled at her to get her attention. She finally began to come to her senses. She was alive. Jericho had saved her life. She stepped toward him. As she drew near, he reached for the backpack and started to check her for injury. Grabbing him, she ignored how his eyes went wide with shock and then fear. As he reached for a handgun, she pulled him to her chest, pressing her lips to his and kissing him wildly. It was animalistic. She heard the sound of the pistol clattering to the floor as he kissed her back, wrapping his arms around her. They kissed for a few minutes before she broke it and still in his embrace lifted her shirt up and off. She wore no bra. Fuck me, Suzanne said as she kicked off her shoes. Yes, ma'am, he said, lifting her off her feet and kissing her before carrying her to a renovated jail cell as romantically as possible. They lay in bed naked, his arm holding her close as her head rested on his chest. They had crossed a line that they both knew they would cross eventually. Still, that hadn't alleviated the gravity of the moment. I'm not a slut. Suzanne said to herself as much as to him. I don't think you're one. Jericho placed a soft kiss on her forehead. You're the third man I've slept with in almost as many months. Was your boyfriend before Zag your first? Jericho asked. 
Yes, she said, still unable to look him in the eyes. It seems so far in the past now. Things were still mostly working when Greg turned. We had power. The TV got one channel, and if the weather was just right, we got this guy running a radio station. She chuckled. Now that feels like another life. She could feel him nod in agreement. Yeah, it feels like I've got someone else's memories when I think back to the before times, Jericho echoed. Now everything is different. We're not on top of the food chain. There's a fate worse than death, and now relationships seem more important. Not specific ones, but having them. When I was in the Air Force, I would form intense bonds with people only to have them broken when it was time to go to a new base where deployment ended. The people changed, but having new people to share the hardship with taught me to form new bonds. And fast. Suzanne fell silent, pondering his words. We could end up being the last people on Earth. Jericho pulled her close to him and went to kiss the top of her head, but thought better of it seeing the zombie's gore matting her hair. We'd be the modern-day Adam and Eve, and I'd be thankful to have you here with me so I didn't have to live out the rest of my life alone. Suzanne shuddered. That sounds horrible. I couldn't imagine being the only human left. I think I'd just... Me too, he said as an awkward silence filled the room. Listen, today when that zombie almost got you, Jericho sniffled. I had to make a choice. If I didn't get the shot... It's okay, Suzanne said softly. I would have shot you. I will never let you suffer, and if you're ever in that situation, don't hesitate to take the shot. Please. Please. Suzanne buried her face in his chest. I don't want to think about it. Okay, but just keep it in mind. She changed the subject. I am probably pretty gross right now. Want to take a shower? She grinned. Like a couple's shower? Something like that? I'd love to. He leaned in for a kiss before lifting her and carrying her to the station's locker room. Day 415 The diamond ring on Suzanne's left ring finger kept drawing her attention from the direction of town and country. It brought a smile to her face as she thought about the man, her man, who would be returning from his grocery run any moment. While marriage was an artifact from the before times, it didn't matter. The ring had been a family heirloom from Jericho's maternal grandmother, something he had held on to in memory of all those he had lost. She was anxious for his return. It was time for her to tell him, she had decided, about the weight she was putting on, about why she was taking longer than normal in the bathroom in the morning, about how, even with limited options, there were certain foods she began avoiding even the smell of. The thought of a pregnancy excited and petrified her. She would be carrying and delivering the child without medical care or family support beyond Jericho. She distracted herself from the worry and went back to watching for him to return. There had been an influx of zombies shambling through town and Jericho wanted to stock up on supplies. He had seen herds move through town and that kept them locked inside the station for several days, so they needed to make sure there was enough food and other necessities. She had a sneaking suspicion that he knew she carried his child. A wave of nausea made her scramble for the bucket she had carried up with her. She retched into it, the smell only making her puke more. Suzanne! Jericho's voice rose from the other side of the hill, blocking her view of the town and country plaza. She pulled herself away from the bucket to see him running toward the station. Suzanne! Shoot them! He screamed in a panic. Shoot me a path! She moved back toward the sniper nest and gripping the rifle looked over the edge. He was on the opposite side of the road and zombies had shuffled out from behind the police station while she was lost in thought. They had moved to block his path and another group had come out from the neighboring building. He was trapped. She shouldered the rifle and her vision tunneled as she aligned the scope's crosshairs on what had once been a woman. She took a breath. After exhaling, but before she inhaled again, Suzanne squeezed the trigger. She barely registered the exploding head before she continued picking off the undead. Yes, way to go! Jericho screamed. Suzanne did not have time to celebrate. There were more than she had ever dealt with when sitting watching for Jericho. 
She squeezed the trigger and heard a dry click. Fuck! Out of ammo! She yelled as one hand worked the magazine release and the other searched for a replacement. Finding it, she slammed it into place and racked the next round. She sighted a creature that was seconds from sinking his teeth into Jericho. With another squeeze of the trigger, another head blasted to pieces. Jericho was almost home, and he looked up and their eyes met. He smiled at her. A smile unearthed a memory buried deep in her soul. Suzanne blinked away the idle thoughts. She was about to move to the ladder to get to ground level and slip inside with her partner when a zombie appeared out of nowhere. Jericho! She screamed for him, watching helplessly as the undead creature latched onto him, its teeth sinking into his shoulder. Fuck! He screamed as the zombie pushed him to the ground, its teeth gnawing. He looked up at Suzanne. Their eyes met again. Please! Tears began to flow as she once more shouldered the rifle and took aim, this time at the last man she would ever love. She saw his face contorted in pain, pleading with her. She closed her eyes and inhaled deeply, opening them as she exhaled. The crosshairs, still square on his forehead, she pulled the trigger. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story, Suzanne, by Xavier Poe Kane. Not yet a best-selling author, Xavier Poe Kane is a former door gunner on the International Space Station. When not making the galaxy safe for democracy, he writes whatever weirdness comes to mind. He currently lives in the woods with his wife Morticia in a state of mutual weirdness with their dogs Chuck Norris and the three-legged Jabba the Hutt. Thanks to the GI Bill, he has an MFA in popular fiction writing and publishing from Emerson College. He is currently working on his second publication, a collection of short stories titled Broken Hearts and Other Horrors. Tonight's tale, Suzanne, is part of this collection as well as a few others featured on Fear from the Heartland. This collection will be out soon in print and audiobook, narrated by yours truly. You can hook up with Xavier and check out what consumes him at his website, www.xaviercane.com. That's X-A-V-I-E-R-K-A-N-E dot com. You can also go to Amazon.com and search for Xavier O. Kane, and that will take you to his author page. Or Twitter at xaviercane 9 and on Facebook, Xavier Kane. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd really appreciate it. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland.
My mother died suddenly and unexpectedly sometime in the early hours of Sunday morning. The coroner said she suffered a massive stroke, and her death was instantaneous. This brought me some small comfort, knowing that she hadn't suffered in the end. I was the one who found her. I arrived at her tidy, semi-detached suburban house at Sunday lunchtime, bringing her groceries for the coming week. I feared the worst when she didn't answer the door, after repeated knocks and rings. It was with great trepidation that I used my spare key and marched through the hallway, shouting my mother's name in a panic as I frantically searched, hoping for the best, but expecting the worst outcome. I found her lying down on the sofa, her eyes shut. Mom looked peaceful, like she'd simply fallen asleep. For a fleeting second, I believed this might be the case, but when I touched her skin, it was ice cold. It didn't take me long to realize she had no pulse and wasn't breathing. Finding my mother's lifeless body was a very traumatic experience. However, I felt oddly calm at the time as I went through the ritual of calling an ambulance and waiting for the paramedics to arrive and tell me what I already knew. My father had died one year before, having lost a long battle against cancer. My parents had been married for 36 years and mom dedicated herself to caring for her husband after his diagnosis. When he died, the largest part of her died with him. She was overcome with grief, barely able to function and holding little interest in life. I asked her to move in with us, thinking it would do her good to be around family, but she steadfastly refused to leave the home she'd shared with her husband for three decades. Instead, we compromised. I went to see her every day, doing her shopping and making sure she was eating, washing, looking after herself. I always hoped she would bounce back, but deep down, I realized it was only a matter of time. Mom's death certificate said she would succumbed to a stroke, but I knew she died of a broken heart. It's tough, losing your parents, even when... Like me, you're an adult with a family of your own. I'm married, have two kids, so I'm very blessed. But I still miss my mom and dad every day. Many people will relate to my loss, but this isn't why I'm writing this story. What I'm here to talk about is the 40-year-old diary I found in my mother's attic. I never met my uncle. My mother's brother died a few years before I was born. Mom spoke very fondly of her older brother and how he'd looked out for her when they were little. She didn't like talking about his death, only saying he was a policeman killed in the line of duty. We took this to mean he served in the Royal Ulster Constabulary and was probably killed during the Troubles. This ethno-religious conflict plagued our home country of Northern Ireland for nearly 30 years. Mom got very upset every time the topic was brought up, so she really talked about my uncle's police career when I was growing up. My sister and I had taken on the emotionally draining task of clearing out my parents' house after Mom died. We found this quite difficult as just about every photograph ornament and knickknack had some sort of sentimental value or memory attached to it. We shed more than a few tears during those days of work, and I found it upsetting to be in the house where I discovered mom's dead body, but we supported each other and persevered. I found the dust-covered old box in the back of the attic, buried under a year's worth of memorabilia and assorted junk. It contained what little remained of my late uncle's possessions, mostly related to his service with RUC. Inside, I found his neatly folded uniform and peaked cap, both in miraculously good condition given their age. 
Thankfully, the moth hadn't gotten at the material. Other than this, there were a few old black and white photographs of my uncle on his graduation day from the police training college. There he was, looking smart and handsome in his dress uniform, standing to attention while smiling for the camera. He looked very impressive. I guess my uncle was slightly younger than me when those photos were taken, but I could see the family resemblance. I dug deeper into the box of forgotten memories, finding several dog-eared and faded papers relating to his service and postings. And there was something else. A small, leather-bound notebook. I flicked through the first few pages and was taken aback to discover it was my uncle's diary, recording his service as a cop on the front lines of West Belfast during the 1970s, some of the worst years of the Troubles. I informed my sister of the discovery, but she wasn't overly interested, and so I inherited my late uncle's possessions, including his diary. I took the notebook home, intending to study the journal entries in detail. I believed the diary would be of historical interest and provide an insight into an uncle I'd never met. I hoped it would serve as a link to the past, a connection to my family that threatened to vanish after my mother's death. However, I became increasingly disturbed the more I read. My uncle had a very difficult job. As a CID detective, he was tasked with investigating some of the most brutal sectarian murders of the period, while at the same time being a target for the paramilitaries. His entries demonstrated he was working under tremendous mental strain. I trained as a counselor and would conclude from his writings that my uncle suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. His details and visceral descriptions of murder scenes and atrocities make for difficult reading, but there are elements of his story that I cannot explain, incidents and occurrences beyond rational understanding. For this reason, I have decided to transcribe and post my uncle's diary entries, hoping that someone with more insight than me may shed some light on the bizarre and disturbing events described by my late uncle. And so, here it is. November 1976. I've never kept a diary before. I never had any inclination to. The truth is, I'm not much of a writer. Essays and police reports. Usually that's my lot. That's not to say I'm uneducated. I was the first in my family to go to university, which my parents were proud of. I grew up in a Protestant working class community in East Belfast. Our family wasn't wealthy, but we weren't hard up either. My father worked all his life as a welder in the shipyard, as his father had done before him. I was expected to follow in their footsteps, but I surprised everyone by excelling in my education, gaining a place in a prestigious grammar school before going to Queen's University to study for my law degree. By the time I graduated, my homeland was in turmoil. Civil rights protests had turned violent, with rioting on the streets. The army's purpose to keep the peace. However, the violence escalated, with hundreds of deaths during the early years of the decade. Bombings and shootings were an everyday occurrence, and my home city was being torn apart in front of my very eyes. This made my decision of a career path easier. I hated what the terrorists were doing to my country and wanted to play my part in ending the violence, and so the RUC was the obvious choice. To be fair, my motives weren't entirely altruistic. Northern Ireland's police force was rapidly expanding due to the security situation, so thanks to my university degree, I was able to apply for a fast track into the CID, with the prospect of further promotions to follow. I finished my training during the summer of 1973, graduating from the police college with my parents and little sister in attendance. A proud day, but soon I was thrown in at the deep end, with my first posting in Goth Barracks. I'd seen some terrible things over the last three years. The aftermath of bombings. Human bodies torn to shreds by bullets and shrapnel. And colleagues gunned down while carrying out their duties. These atrocities had an impact upon me, but I got through my first posting. I got redeployed to the CID section in West Belfast. A classic out of the frying pan and into the fire situation. My life has spiralled out of control as of late. 
The stresses of the job have taken their toll. My girlfriend left me a couple of weeks ago, as she could no longer deal with my erratic behaviour and violent outbursts. I can't really blame her. I hardly speak with my family and friends anymore. My job has become all-encompassing, and I have little time for anything else. When I'm not working, I drink heavily, trying to drown my sorrows and forget the horrific things I've seen out on the streets. It doesn't help, but I can't stop. As 1976 draws to a close, I'm working on two major investigations. One is against a skilled and ruthless provisional IRA bomb maker, codenamed Nemesis. This dangerous individual has been responsible for dozens of attacks against the security forces and commercial businesses in the city centre. We've come close to capturing Nemesis, but the bastard keeps slipping through our fingers. I have no doubt that he'll keep bombing until we either capture or kill him. The second investigation relates to a loyalist murder gang led by a terrorist known as The Butcher. This gang specializes in kidnapping Catholic men and brutally torturing their victims before slitting their throats. The sheer brutality of this gang has shocked and terrified the population, even though the city has long become hardened to violence and death. Blood is running through the streets of Belfast, and we're barely able to hold the line. I was raised in the Protestant faith and made to go to Sunday school as a child. Nevertheless, I've never been particularly religious. I'm not a superstitious man. But some of what I've witnessed over the last few months defies any logical explanation. I honestly don't know whether I'm going mad. But I've become increasingly convinced that the bloodshed has unleashed something truly evil onto the war-torn streets of Belfast. This shadowy entity stalks me and haunts my dreams. For this reason, I decided to keep this journal and record what I see and hear, hoping that one day, somebody will be able to make some sense of it all. For with God as my witness, for the first time in my life, I am truly scared. November 21st, 1976 The butcher is struck again. A housewife discovered the body dumped in a back alley off Agnes Street. At first she assumed the corpse was a discarded mannequin doll, as the wounds were so severe. The victim's injuries were consistent with the previous murders. The man is still to be identified, but we've determined he's in his early twenties. There were multiple stab wounds and deep cuts across his hands, arms and torso, none of which would have proved fatal. The cause of death was the man's throat being slit cut so deep that the bone was exposed. The torture and killing occurred at a different location, the body being dumped here by the murder gang. We'll trace the victim's identity over the next day or two, after we trawl through the missing persons lists. The family will be notified, and the press will need to be updated. Doubtless there will be more sensationalist headlines in the tabloid papers. This is the third murder by the butcher gang in the last six months. All the victims have been young, Catholic males kidnapped at random from the streets. Undoubtedly, there will be a statement released by some anonymous paramilitary spokesman. A generic claim that the victim confessed under interrogation to membership of the IRA and had been executed for crimes against the people of Ulster. Our investigation focused upon three loyalist terror cells operating in the Shankill area. I have strong suspicions about the butcher's identity, but so far, we have no evidence. The gang has been good at covering their tracks, and witnesses are in short supply. We spend most of the day at the crime scene, freezing on a grey, drizzly afternoon. The army set up a security cordon as was our standard procedure. Several locals gathered around the cordon, the usual combination of nosy neighbours and ghoulish voyeurs hoping for a glance at the body. A few journalists showed up during the afternoon, snapping photos and taking notes. They asked for a statement, but we weren't willing to give them any information at this early stage. Night had fallen by the time we moved the corpse. Shifting his remains into a body bag and putting the poor fellow into the back of a waiting ambulance. By now, most of the crowd had moved on. They'd seen it all before, after all. I scanned the cordon as my colleagues moved the body, spotting one solitary figure lingering at the far side of the street lurking in the shadows 
and glaring in my direction. The stranger was clad all in black, with a hood covering his head. I couldn't see his face or make out any of his features. I'm not a man who scares easily, but the sight of this mysterious figure brought a chill down my spine. He looked like a man out of his time, a throwback to a previous age. Nevertheless, despite his odd appearance, there was something strangely familiar about this interloper. I felt sure I'd seen him before, although where and when, I cannot recall. I stared at this individual for the best part of two minutes, trying to get the measure of him. He didn't move an inch during the whole time, standing perfectly still and seemingly not reacting to anything occurring around him. Even though I could not see his eyes, I could nevertheless feel his harsh glare burning through me. My first instinct was to turn and flee, but I needed to show strength as a policeman. This individual hadn't technically committed an offence, but security legislation gave me the right to detain and question him. I decided to do so, but before I could make my move, I got temporarily distracted by one of my colleagues asking me a question. When I turned back, the dark figure had gone, apparently disappearing without a trace. I asked the army lieutenant in command of the security cordon about the mysterious man, but the officer could not recall seeing him, nor could any of his men. The whole incident left me feeling shaken and confused. Had I imagined this figure? I don't believe so. I have an ominous feeling that I've seen this stranger before somewhere, perhaps more than once, but always lurking in the shadows, somewhere on the periphery. I fear I'm being stalked. Perhaps the IRA or some other paramilitary group is targeting me, gathering intelligence for a possible hit. I've therefore decided to become more vigilant regarding my security. Hopefully, I'm overreacting. But you can't be too careful these days. December 5th, 1976 I've been receiving threatening phone calls to my home line. Three nights in a row now. All during the early hours. The first night it was little more than heavy breathing and low groans. Making me think it was just a sex pest. I told the caller to go to hell and hung up the phone. The next night, I heard low whispers down the line so soft I couldn't make out a single word. By the third night, I could make out words, but they were spoken in a language I could not understand. The male voice at the other end of the line has a detached, almost inhuman quality. I have been unable to make out any accent or speech patterns that could help identify the caller. I have developed this unsettling feeling that I am being watched, and these late night calls seem to confirm a pattern of intimidation. Tomorrow, I will report to the duty officer, and I plan to sleep with my service revolver close to hand from now on. January 4th, 1977 I was called to the scene of a bombing this morning. An army patrol was hit on the lower falls by a small but deadly device hidden inside a beer keg, detonated by a hidden command wire. Four soldiers lay injured from the blast, but the man closest to the bomb took the brunt of it, losing both legs and suffering severe chest wounds. He was still alive when we arrived at the scene. His body was reduced to a bloody mess, his eyes mad with shock and pain as he screamed out and grasped for the bloody stumps that were once his legs. They rushed him to the hospital in a Saracen APC, but he died from massive blood loss before they got there. I later learned the dead soldier was only 19 years old. We evacuated the wounded and secured the scene. What remained of the device was removed for further forensic investigation. Although the design and MO all pointed to the bomb maker we were pursuing, an IRA operative codenamed Nemesis. His devices are becoming increasingly lethal as he plies his deadly trade. We didn't get long to examine the scene. A crowd soon gathered on the edge of the security cordon, including a number of young men who cheered and mocked the wounded. The soldiers manning the blockade were from the same company as the dead private, and understandably, they were upset and angry. A few soldiers reacted to the provocation, moving into the crowd while swinging their batons and attempting in vain to make arrests. Soon, more local youths arrived on the scene carrying half-bricks and glass bottles, which they flung at the line of soldiers. Within minutes, the situation had descended into a full-scale riot. As the violence escalated, 
the army officer in command on the ground told us he could no longer guarantee our safety. As intelligence suggested, the IRA may use the riot as a cover to launch a gun attack upon our personnel. Therefore, we had little choice but to evacuate the scene, knowing all too well that potential forensic evidence would be destroyed in the rioting. I saw him at the corner of my eye when I got shoved into the back of an APC, the dark figure, the same mysterious man I'd seen that night in November on Agnes Street. It was broad daylight this time, so I got a better look at him. Not that I could see much. His head lay hidden under a dark hood, and his face by some sort of mask. He blatantly stood in the middle of the street as all hell broke out around him, with rioters throwing missiles and soldiers firing rubber bullets. The chaos seemed to not affect the interloper, as he showed no fear of being shot or struck. I honestly couldn't tell whether he was directing the riot or was oblivious to it. However, once again, he appeared to be looking straight at me, as if he'd come to this violent place specifically to confront me. But I only cast my eyes on the hooded man for a brief moment before an army NCO physically dragged me to the back of the vehicle, slamming the steel door shut behind me. This time, I'm certain that the dark figure wasn't a figment of my imagination. He is real, and is deliberately turning up at crime scenes where he knows I'll be posted, stalking me through these war-torn streets. I need to get this bastard, before he gets me. January 11th, 1977 The late night phone calls have become less frequent but more sinister in their tone. Last night, he spoke in understandable English for the first time, speaking just three terrifying words in a low, croaking voice. I see you. I'm now convinced there is a direct link between the shadowy figure and the threatening calls. I must remain vigilant. I didn't sleep at all last night, but instead drank until dawn with my Webley service revolver by my side. These images keep running through my head. The butchered victim, the screaming soldier without his legs, and always the dark figure watching and taunting me. Honestly, I don't know how much more of this I can take. January 12th, 1977. My boss saw the state of me when I turned up for roll call and sent me straight home. I've been ordered to rest up for a week before returning to duty. I told my commander about the calls and the stalker. He says he'll look into it, but I got the distinct impression he thinks I'm mad. Perhaps he's right. I've been under extreme stress and haven't been sleeping. Hopefully, the rest will do me good. January 15th, 1977. I'm still off duty, but got a call from one of my colleagues. The chief suspect in the butcher gang has been thankfully locked up on a weapons charge. With a successful conviction, he'll get at least five years. It's not what we'd hoped for. The bastard should be charged with murder if you ask me but at least he'll be off the streets. The news has boosted my spirits somewhat, but the violence continues across the city. Yesterday, there were a series of bombings across the town centre, and no doubt Nemesis played his role. The streets are awash with blood, and terror stalks the streets. What can one man do against such unrelenting hatred? January 20th, 1977. Last night was my first shift back on duty following my leave of absence. My boss has taken me off to murder investigations. I objected, but not too hard. I got put on night duty with a squad of uniformed officers. This was supposed to be an easy job to get me back into the swing of things, but it didn't turn out that way. It was a freezing cold night. Me and the boys were warming ourselves up with hot mugs of tea when the call came in. A disturbance was reported on the back street off Antrim Road, in the north of the city. Local residents had reported strange activity, and raised voices emanating from inside an abandoned Victorian mill at the end of the street. We went out in strength, eight heavily armed officers travelling in two armoured Land Rovers as we sped through the dark city streets. The area was mixed religion, but known for IRA activity, and so we were understandably cautious as we feared a potential set up an ambush. 
Our suspicions heightened when we reached the scene and discovered the street abandoned and eerily quiet. Proceeding with caution, the sergeant in command ordered two officers to set up a cordon at the end of the street, while the rest proceeded with guns drawn. The road was typically of those throughout the working class districts of Belfast, with rows of red bricked terraced houses, all two ups and two downs dating back to the Victorian era. The mill sat at the far end of the street, its dark structure casting an ominous shadow over the small houses beneath it. At one time, the mill would have employed the majority of the men and women in this area, but it had long since closed like so many others, resulting in high unemployment in communities such as this. The abandoned industrial building held a sinister appearance, reminding me of a grim citadel from some kind of dark fairy tale. We had no idea what to expect. I hoped we were dealing with minor vandalism caused by bored teenagers, but something didn't seem right about the whole situation. There was a terrible tension in the air. We all felt it. Once again, I had the feeling that someone was watching me. I carefully scanned the road, but it was too dark to see anything. My fear was back. Worse than ever. I worried then that I'd come back to duty too early. My head was still a mess, and my paranoia was taking over. But there was nothing I could do at that moment, except march forward. Suddenly, the street was no longer silent. We heard a faint noise emanating from the supposedly abandoned mill, growing gradually louder the closer we came. It took me a moment to comprehend what I was hearing. Multiple voices were chanting in unison, singing deeply in a language that wasn't English. I thought I recognized a few words in Latin, but couldn't be sure. This was a bizarre occurrence, and the last thing any of us had expected to encounter this night. There was something very sinister about the strange chanting. It felt out of place and time, but yet oddly familiar. I could tell the other officers were as uneasy as I was. No doubt, we all wanted to turn around and run for the hills. But we're professionals, and had a job to do. The unsettling chanting continued, growing louder and faster until it reached a crescendo, before it suddenly stopped. And then we heard a scream, blood-curdling as it cut through the cold night air, chilling me to my very bones. Move, move, move! Our sergeant cried out, as he surely realized someone was in trouble. We began to sprint along the cobblestones, making for the sealed front entrance of the mill, clutching our weapons close, ready for action. The Sarge reached the door first, smashing it open with his heavy boot. He barged inside, and we all followed. I feared what we would discover inside, but what we found was beyond my wildest imagination. The interior of the derelict building was largely shrouded in darkness, with the only light coming from lit candles and torches on the floor and hanging from the walls. A circle was drawn in the center of the floor, surrounded by candles. The Sarge used a handheld battery-powered torch to illuminate the scene. To my horror, I realized the circle was, in fact, a pentagram, and at its very center lay a slaughtered animal, a goat by the look of it. The creature's throat had been cut, and its stomach sliced open, exposing its intestines and internal organs. The place stank like an abattoir, and the ground was saturated with blood. It took me a second to comprehend what I saw here, the satanic symbol, and slaughtered animal. It was some sort of sacrifice. How could this be possible? The sergeant nervously raised his torch and shone the light upwards to reveal a half dozen figures, dressed in black robes and hooded masks. Each one stood perfectly still, glaring with menace in our direction. All carried daggers, stained with the blood of the slaughtered goat. The sergeant screamed at them to drop their weapons and surrender. We covered them with our guns as we waited to see whether they would comply. I clutched hold of my Webley with both hands, aiming at the chest of the closest dagger-wielding maniac. I was perfectly prepared to shoot the bastard down if he showed even the slightest sign of resistance. But this proved unnecessary, as suddenly, all six dropped their knives and calmly got down on their knees, allowing us to move in and handcuff them. I breathed a sigh of relief, but the feeling proved to be short-lived. 
When we unmasked the suspects, we discovered they were four males and two females of varied ages. They refused to give their names and carried no forms of ID, or any personal items for that matter. We arrested them on suspicion of trespassing, animal cruelty, and possession of offensive weapons. The Sarge seemed unsettled by the whole affair, saying he'd never seen anything like it in all of his twenty years' service. And what shook me to my core was when one of the suspects turned his head around and looked me directly in the eye, specifically picking me out from the crowd. He was an unpleasant-looking man, perhaps in his late thirties or early forties. He had one of those thin, weasel-like faces, pale skin, and bloodshot eyes. His chin became lost underneath thick, untidy stubble, and he stagged to the high heavens, which suggested he hadn't bathed or showered in days. I experienced a cold chill inside me whenever he made eye contact, but I stood my ground, knowing I couldn't show this lowlife any fear. He opened his mouth to reveal chipped yellow teeth, and he spoke in broken English. I didn't recognize the accent, but I thought it sounded Eastern European, and what he said was this. Our master, he sees you. He will come for you. Soon, you will have nowhere left to hide. I stood glued to the spot, my jaw hanging in disbelief. His words terrified me, and I had no response. One of my comrades reacted, punching the suspect in his stomach and telling him in no uncertain terms to shut his fucking gob. Two officers dragged the man away while I remained frozen, unable to speak or move until the sergeant patted my back, telling me to head back to the waiting Land Rovers. I didn't sleep a wink last night after I got home. Instead, I turned to the bottle once again, drinking until dawn. I realized this isn't a solution, but I needed something to settle me after what I'd been through. In the morning, I received a phone call from the duty sergeant. He told me that all six suspects arrested at the mill were released without charge. The orders had come from the top, but no other explanation was given. The sergeant mentioned other ritualistic animal sacrifices and black masses occurring across Ulster, and rumoured links to British military intelligence. The theory was some kind of psychological operation aimed against the paramilitaries and their supporters. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Is there no end to this madness? Has this entire city descended into the depths of hell? How much more can one man be expected to take? February 4th, 1977. I almost died today. They came within inches of taking me out. It had been a quiet couple of weeks, or at least as quiet as a cop working in Belfast could have. I was still on the beach with the uniformed patrols. There had been incidents, of course, but none as bizarre and unsettling as the encounter in the old mill. I hadn't received any threatening phone calls in the last fortnight, cut down on my drinking, and was even sleeping better. I truly believed I had turned a corner, but you could never take your eye off the ball in this job. One unit got called out to a crime scene in Bally Murphy. The switchboard received a call reporting a break-in, so we were sent out to investigate. As usual, we went out strong, attending in armoured Land Rovers and fully armed. Details were sketchy, and so we were naturally suspicious. Rightly so as it transpired, because this caution saved our lives. The device lay hidden inside a dustbin left down a side alley. I was only about twelve feet away from the bomb when it detonated. I remember a blinding light and a deafening din, followed a split second later by a powerful wave of heat that blew me off my feet, throwing me backward. I hit the ground hard, feeling a sharp pain shoot through my entire body. After that, I lay dazed on the pavement my head throbbing, my vision blurred, and my ears still ringing from the blast. The dark figure appeared from nowhere and stood right above me. My eyesight was still affected. I couldn't make out his facial features. He was little more than a dark shadow standing over my stricken body, blocking out the sun. Nevertheless, I knew it was him. The same shadowy figure who's been stalking me for weeks. And now, he had me, wounded and helpless, left completely at his mercy. My vision was starting to come back, but I couldn't bear to look at this hideous figure, so I closed my eyes and prepared for the end. Seconds passed, 
and slowly my hearing returned. I heard men shouting and the heavy clump of boots against the pavement. Reluctantly, I opened my eyes and to my great relief, the dark man was gone, his shadowy figure replaced by the concerned looks of my comrades as they came to my aid. Miraculously, I walked away from the blast with only minor injuries, cut, bruises, and a slight concussion. A piece of flying shrapnel had grazed my head, a couple of inches to the right, and it would have lodged into my skull. It didn't take long for the investigating officers to establish that the device was the work of Nemesis, the IRA bomber responsible for so many previous attacks in this part of the city. The bomb design and attack style was similar to that which killed the young soldier in January. It seems that, on this occasion, the IRA member tasked with detonating the device had missed his mark. The bomb had gone off a tad too early. If it waited just a couple more seconds to detonate, then I would be dead, and several of my colleagues severely maimed. As it turned out, we all walked away from the blast in one piece. I should be feeling like the luckiest man alive right now. But I don't. The dark figure is back. I don't know whether he's a man or some kind of ghoulish entity. But I know he's out to get me. My colleagues think I'm either mad or delusional. And my boss has put me on extended leave of absence. But it won't matter. He, or it, failed on this occasion. But he won't stop until I'm in the ground. My days are numbered. It's only a matter of time now. February 7th, 1977. The calls have started again. Worse than ever this time. The things I've listened to were surely never meant for human ears. I'm disconnecting my phone. There's no reason for anybody to be calling me. I'm still on a leave of absence from work, but I find no respite. I spend my nights drinking with my gun by my side. I can't sleep for any length of time. Every time I close my eyes, my mind's filled with these horrifying images. The figure is always there, haunting my dreams. I know he is watching me, and I'll never be free. February 9th, 1977. My sister came to my house this afternoon. I guess she's worried about me. She's probably been trying to call me but can't get through with the phone unplugged. She was at the door for more than 15 minutes, repeatedly banging the knocker and ringing the bell. I didn't answer. My curtains were all drawn, and the lights turned off. She must have thought I was out, so she eventually gave up. I can't bear for her to see me like this, her big brother, reduced to a cowardly, drunken mess. Whatever is happening to me, whoever and whatever is after me, I can't let my little sister get involved. I need to protect her. February 13th, 1977. The IRA bomber known as Nemesis is dead. The security forces played no role in his demise. Ironically, he died by his own hands after a bomb he was working on detonated prematurely, blowing him to bits and demolishing the safe house he was sequestered inside. It's an occupational hazard for those in his line of work. My bosses would rather have arrested and convicted the bastard, but they weren't necessarily displeased with the outcome. Neither was I. Not at first, anyway. My commander invited me to attend the scene. I was still technically on suspension, but my boss was willing to bend the rules to allow me to be there when they carried the bomber's dismembered body parts out from the rubble. The bastard had tried to kill me after all, so the hope was that his violent death would grant me some closure. We arrived on the street to discover a chaotic scene. The road was cordoned off at both ends while soldiers and police officers dug through the rubble of the demolished house. While the security forces worked, the predictable crowds gathered around. Some young men swore and shouted abuse at the soldiers but most people were just curious. One woman stood out, though. A young woman with long red hair tied back in a bun. She was upset and very agitated, screaming at the troops about a missing child. It took us some time to establish what had happened. The woman's child was an eight-year-old girl called Effie. She'd been playing on the street in front of the safe house at the exact moment the bomb had exploded. We found her dead body buried underneath the rubble an hour later. Her mother wailed in all-encompassing grief when we carried her little girl out, grabbing hold of the tiny body and grasping it tightly to her bosom. I'd seen a lot of terrible things during my time, 
but nothing as tragic as this. And he was there, of course. The dark man, lingering in the shadows just outside the cordon, watching and mocking me. It seems he is drawn to death, destruction and human agony. I think he thrives on it. I attempted to ignore him, but I could feel his hateful glare burning into the back of my head. I returned home afterward and instantly hit the bottle. I couldn't stop thinking about that poor little girl. What had she ever done to deserve this? I thought of my younger sister and how I'd feel if something so awful happened to her. Later that night, I turned on the radio to listen to the news report of today's incident. The IRA had released a statement describing the dead bomber as a brave Irish patriot who gave his life in the cause of freedom while young Effie's death was a tragic accident and a painful reminder of the British occupation of our country. I saw red when I heard those words, grabbing an empty vodka bottle and flinging it across the room at the radio, smashing both into pieces. I couldn't stand the hypocrisy. There would be condemnations, of course, but it would make no difference. The war would go on. The horror never ends. February 15th, 1977. He came to my home last night. My safe haven had been breached at about two in the morning. Finally, after weeks of insomnia, I had managed to not often get some sleep, only to be awoken by a noise outside my window during the early hours. I rubbed my tired eyes and got out of bed, creeping across the room and sheepishly peeking through the curtains of the street below. My heart almost stopped when I saw him standing there, as bold as you like. Again, I could see little in the dim light, but it was definitely him, the same dark figure who had been stalking me for weeks. He stood perfectly still on the opposite side of the street, glaring up at my bedroom window, his dark shape casting a foreboding shadow across the pavement. I was frozen in fear for a moment, unable to avert my gaze or move from the window. It was one thing to see this dark stalker at a crowded crime scene, but now he was here, at my home. I had no soldiers or police colleagues to back me up, and I'd never felt so alone in my whole life. I knew he'd come for me, and was sure this was the end game. But suddenly, my fear was replaced by angry defiance. I was determined not to go down without a fight. Tearing myself away from the window, I grabbed my revolver from my bedside drawer and stormed out from the room before tearing down the staircase and making for the front door. I flung it open and dashed out onto the pavement, brandishing my loaded revolver as I went. I was determined to unload six bullets into the bastard's head but my enemy was gone, having disappeared without a trace. I frantically searched the street in both directions, but there was nothing. After several minutes, I realized it wouldn't look good if my neighbor saw me brandishing a gun out in the middle of her quiet suburban street, so I retreated inside my house. I knew the bastard would be back, so I barricaded the doors and stood guard by the window, my weapon drawn and at the ready. I didn't expect to last the night, but I made it to dawn. I'm sure the dark man is taunting me, prolonging my misery before he finally strikes. I'm not a religious man, but tonight, I prayed. I don't think anyone is listening. I just want this to end, one way or another. February 16th, 1977. I spent all day keeping guard, drinking cheap vodka and clutching my gun, keeping a wary eye on the street. I know he, or it, will be back. I've had a lot of time to think during these long and tense hours, to recall all the awful scenes I've witnessed over these last few weeks. I truly believe that evil has taken hold of this country, infecting the hearts of men, making them commit the most heinous of crimes. It seems like God has abandoned this land, leaving us in the hands of demons that walk the earth. What is this creature that stalks me? I am sure it's not of this world. The morning was quiet, the calm before the storm. At lunchtime, I heard a mighty blast in the distance, probably caused by a bomb attack in the town centre. The violence continues unabated, and this evil entity feeds off it. I've made it to dusk, but now he'll come for me under cover of darkness. February 17th, 1977. 
He's here, standing in the same spot as last night. I'm watching him as I write this, and he's staring right back at me. I'm tired of living in fear. I'm going to confront him, whatever the hell he is, and this time he won't slip through my fingers. I saw its face. I looked into its eyes. Dear God, those eyes. He is not a man, not a human being. Of this I have no doubt. When he lowered his hood, I saw something I could not comprehend. Those demonic orbs in place of its eyes stared into my very soul. It took everything from me, leaving me nothing but an empty shell. I could never forget what I saw. Every time I close my eyes, I see him. I see the bodies. The bomb sites. All the evil that has taken hold. I can't go on like this. There is only one way out. Whoever finds this diary, please tell my parents and sister that I love them. And I'm sorry. Please, God. Show me mercy. Well, that's it. My late uncle's lost journal transcribed word for word. I found it very emotional to read, and I've been having difficulties coming to terms with this story. I now understand why my mother refused to talk about her brother's death throughout her whole life. After reading his account, I dug deeper, researching in an attempt to verify the details. As you probably guessed, my uncle killed himself soon after writing his final entry. He shot himself through the head using a service revolver. Sadly, suicides were all too common for serving RUC officers, unsurprising given the immense stress of their job. I was able to confirm most of the incidents he described, including the murders and bombings. They all happened. However, there is no record of the arrests at the Black Mass. If this sort of thing did occur, it must have been kept out of the history books. I don't know what to think about my uncle's account. The most logical explanation is that he suffered a mental breakdown due to the stresses of his job or was suffering from PTSD. Isolated and without professional help, he was unable to sleep and drank heavily to dull his pain. This, in turn, could have resulted in paranoid delusions, making him see things that weren't really there. I would like to believe this and find some closure to the whole affair. However, there is one detail that I've not been able to explain away. While making my inquiries, I was able to speak with one of the officers who attended my uncle's house after his suicide. The man has long since retired from the police force, but he remembered that day vividly. He described manning a cordon while my uncle's body was removed from the house and loaded into a waiting ambulance. During this grim procession, he recalls seeing a solitary figure watching from the end of the street, a hooded man dressed in dark robes, his face covered. The officer says he was momentarily distracted by the ambulance driving off, but when he turned back, the figure was gone. 